Hey guys, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome to another live broadcast, right? On the BEJ live channel, the official live channel. Remember guys, we go live daily at 10 a.m. JST. So if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, please consider doing so, right? It's very, very important. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers on the live channel. So we're able to enable and activate all these features that we need on this channel to do what we need to do. So again, thanks for coming on. Um, today we have a special guest. Um, the, the discussion today um, should be a fruitful one. It should be a very interesting discussion as well. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys receive some value from this one. Let me just make sure that we're actually live. Everything is okay. Uh, remember to, uh, in addition to subscribing, please share this out to on your social media platform, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, et cetera, so we can get some more people up in here. Of course, this is not the main channel. And those on the main channel are, are going to be missing out. So let me just let them know that we're live on the BEJ uh, live streaming channel right now so they can come on over. So let me just uh, send that message out really quickly and then we can dive into the discussion. Of course, you guys, some of you guys know Mr. Q from his interview. He was also in the documentary that we did as well. Um, so you guys can look out. Um, you guys can check out those as well after this, this live discussion slash interview. Welcome, 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 guys. I'll give me two seconds. Let me just share this on the, the main channel. Okay. There we go. All right. All right. So I'm gonna bring Q on. Let me let me just get him on real quick. Q, what's up? Good How morning, Randall. How are you doing? How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, man. Um, before we even start, I want you to introduce yourself to the the world for those who don't know you. Tell them who you are. To our five listeners out there, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, six, six. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, as uh, written, I'm, I'm Mr. Q, um, and uh, based in Singapore, I'm a menswear designer. Um, I own a, a bespoke clothing brand uh, out here, so I design and make uh, specialized custom clothing for men. But my specialism is tropical tailoring, uh, so I specialize in making things for you know the tropics. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm a, I, I, I like to I think I have a deft hand at handling things like linen and prints and so on and so forth. Uh, but culturally, as well as, you know, my, my background, I'm from Zimbabwe uh, originally. Mm -hmm. So I was born and raised in, in Zimbabwe in, in southwest of the country in a city called Vulawayo, uh, in a very famous slash infamous, depends which uh, side of the coin you're on, if, uh, infamous yeah. neighborhood uh, called Mziligazi. Um, and I left Zimbabwe when I was 13 years old um, to go to England to join my uh, parents who, who had already been there uh, from, I mean, they left, I think, almost a decade before I joined them. So I was left behind for about seven, eight years um, and then went to, to the UK. And uh, I grew up there, had my, uh, so I, having moved there 13, I had a pretty interesting ba sort of balance between having been born and raised in a different culture and knew enough, engaged enough, and was aware of it, and you know, uh, drenched in it enough to not have lost it, but also young enough to have come into a new country and completely absorb that culture as well uh, in London. And uh, it was a massive, massive culture shock, uh, but in the best possible way. Uh, I, I can hardly think of any negatives, even though I think from someone else looking on the outside, uh, looking from the outside, they would have thought, oh my God, this is terrible, but uh, I was thrown into a <laughs> crazy school um, in in the sort of what they would describe as inner city London. Uh, but uh, yeah, I went to a a pretty a tough school, a tough school. But <laughs> but uh, again, even in hindsight, I only see the best of it. You know, uh, it was an extraordinarily multicultural, multiracial, uh, uh, you know, school. There were twelve hundred students, and I think if I remember, one hundred sixty six languages. Uh, something okay, like that. Wow. Uh, yeah, like you know, in my own class, um, there were twenty-two or twenty-three of us, and in it, amongst those, those twenty-two, twenty-three, there were fifteen different nationalities. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was a very, very diverse uh, school. Uh, but again, coming from Zimbabwe to that is huge, huge culture shock. Anyway, um, so grew up around that um, and uh, immersed myself in all 
things in London. I became a proper London boy, which I really enjoyed. Um, but again, I think in hindsight, I, I, I experienced a different angle of London. I, I engaged London differently. Uh, I was reading the Financial Times by the time I was 15, 16. <laughs> the only kid that walked into school. I was the only kid that walked into that crazy school carrying a pink newspaper, you know, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, I think in some in some regard, I suppose I, I was not aware of the absurdity of doing that, you know. I wasn't aware of the absurdity of a 15-year-old ca carrying the Financial Times or The Guardian um, into you school. Just never cared. You never cared about the perception because that wasn't important. No, it wasn't. At the end of the day, for me, it was just, oh, what am I reading, you know? Uh, and so it never occurred to me uh, how, how peculiar it was. Uh, so then went to I went to art school, you know, uh, London College of Communication, which at the time was called London College of Printing. Um, and it's one of the oldest uh, uh, sort of uh, print media schools in the world. Um, so I went there, uh, did you know, I entered that school at uh, 19 years old, um, and um, uh, which is where I met my wife. Uh, and then, uh, wow. yes, yeah. So, so went through school, uh, art school for three years. Yeah. Um, after that, I set up my own printing studio. Um, I was really fascinated. It's funny. We 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 were at the forefront of learning uh, digital print media, digital art, and designing websites. This is back in two thousand and four, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, now people know my age. <laughs> um, so, old man, old, yeah, old man. man, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, um, I'm joking. <laughs> so we, we were at the forefront of uh, learning digital art, but funny enough, I was introduced to screen printing, which is one of the oldest methods of printing. And I just became fascinated by that. And I got hooked on that. And so I slowly abandoned the digital uh, graphic design element of my course um, and just focused on printing uh, the traditional way, silk screen printing and so on and so forth. Uh, and then when I left university, I carried on. I opened my own small printing studio uh, as a screen printer. I started printing posters and T-shirts, and you know. And then um, I started selling some of my T-shirts in in a in a little market, but that was very brief. Uh, instead, what happened was I started printing more textiles and uh, samples, and presented them to a tailor one day in London, and uh, he really liked them, and uh, he gave me a brief ment uh, ment ment uh, sort of apprenticeship. Uh, this was in Farringdon, back in. Uh, 12 years ago, um, so gave me a, a brief uh, apprenticeship and internship in, in, in his shop. Um, and I carried on printing, started a label, sold it in Belgium and London for a little bit, but that's when the financial crisis kind of hit. And um, my, my, my initial, my, my, my first label kind of had to fold, you know, because um, small independent brands were the first to suffer. And weirdly enough, there's a, a strange mirror effect right now uh, mm -hmm. with what's going on that, um, you know, small independent businesses, uh, of which I'm an owner, um, are now beginning to, you know, falter once again and suffer at the at the behest of uh, this horrible kind of pandemic. You know. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and so now I'm in Singapore. Came here. Came to Singapore eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And okay, so guys, as well, if you want to see the interviews that we did, we went, you know, in depth. Even though you actually gave some more backstory now, uh, more information that you never provided back then. <laughs> but beyond that, the, the interview that we conducted went deep as well. So you guys can check it out after this live stream as well. And one thing that Q brought up right now that I guess we're going to talk about that is the impact of COVID-19 on small and medium, well, I guess small businesses, right? So we're going to talk about that and especially uh, the black community. So small businesses within the black community and how this community specifically uh, will be affected or is being affected by the pandemic and how we can come out on the other side stronger. Um, or yeah, so pretty much that's what we're gonna, the discussion is gonna be centered around that, um, as well as maybe what's taking place also in Africa, in, in China as well, I keep saying Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like my mind for some reason is replacing China with Africa. I'm like, hmm, I hope that's not some type of like foreboding of something that's about to like pop off. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's <laughs> ominous, hoping, yeah. Yeah, right, but, um, but let's talk about it. So tell us like what, are you facing personally, or what do you think? What do you see small businesses within the black community um, facing right now? So, I mean, uh, as, as I said, I'm, I'm in Singapore, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, Singapore is a very small place, by the way. I think I don't, I'm not sure if many people realize, but Singapore is a very, very small place. And if you were to take an atlas, it's actually really difficult to, to, to find it. It's right at the bottom of a uh, right underneath uh, Malaysia, and it's a tiny uh, island. It is really a small, small island. Uh, its population is smaller than it's half of London, you know. Um, 
So with that said, uh, the impact here is it's twofold in the sense that it's, it's very immediate because it's such a small place. So the, 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 the enforcement of things like, like you know, like uh, lockdowns and uh, people, uh, the government uh, dishing out a lot of like a uh, very strategic uh, advice and, and uh, instructions on how people should conduct themselves and, uh, you know, so, in, so, in terms of social navigation, it's very immediate and very fast. And there hasn't been, the, it, at the beginning of this, um, there was almost, a, you know, uh, an air of, um, like, like, like as observed in England, uh, panic buying, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. But that lasted all of about five days or maybe even the, at most, I would say it lasted about a week before okay. the government sort of like, you know, really uh, uh, tempered down people's uh, anxiety. Um, and mm -hmm. th so the sense of law and order is very, very strong now here. Uh, it's very palpable in the sense that um, uh, the government reassured people that, for example, Singapore has got uh, at least at least three months uh, worth of national reserves to keep the country going should any catastrophe happen, right? Okay. Uh, so they they implemented very strict rules not to uh, not. Oh, I don't I don't necessarily think it was rules, but they were just you know emphatic that do not panic buy. Everybody's in this together, you know, sort of thing. That's so that's the positive side that the 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 implementation of you know, uh, rules is actually really effective because it's a small place and it's an island, so you can govern uh, a lot more effectively mm -hmm. um, and with, with immediate results. Uh, so everyone is really following, you know, uh, all the guidelines that are being given. Um, we've, are, we've people, been are, people, are people permitted to go outdoors, like go outside now? Like what is oh, it, like how restrictive yeah. is it? At most in pairs, at most in pairs. Even as a family, you can't go out with more than three people. Uh, okay. But even then, yeah, exactly. And it's mandated, you have to wear a mask if you're outside. I've, I'm actually, uh, I've been hearing quite a few uh, people being fined. Uh, so the immediate fine, if you're sort of uh, met on the street by police or, or sort of local government uh, uh, forces, is uh, if you are not wearing a mask, immediately you get charged a, a $300 fine. Um, wow. Yeah, and it's the, but the second time, if your name comes up a second time, you get caught without a mask, it's $10,000 and possibly imprisonment. Um, it, and, here, they're not, and they're not afraid to implement it. They will do it. <laughs> they will do it, it. It's, it's funny too because when I was in Singapore, right? Remember when I was there just now? Yes. It was the like literally like so different. Like now it's like yes. there's a stark contrast right now because yes. when I was there, my, very few people had mask on. Right, oh, yeah. we were walking around. I was telling people that Singapore right now just seems relaxed in comparison to other yeah. places. Like yeah. people walking about, nothing was happening. Right, and then apparently, I think it was the uh, I was going to extend my trip, and yes. some news broke or something like that, where they were. I think they stopped allowing people to come in from Japan. But when I came yes. in, I could yes. enter the country. Right, so it's like things started getting kind of crazy. I'm like, okay, time time to go. And after That's I right. left, the following week all these restrictions and, and, and things started coming, uh, you know, went into effect. I'm like, snap, like it changed so quickly. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It really did. And uh, and it, it just, just in the last two weeks, that's when they, because up until about two weeks ago, because uh, we've officially now been on lockdown for about three and a half weeks, we're coming into the fourth week now. Um, and up until two weeks ago, the mask was an option, but now it's, it no longer is. Now it's, it's mandated. You have to wear a mask. You know, um, so anyway, to kind of come back to your question now, so that's the side, that's the governance side. And then on the flip side is uh, sort of like the day-to-day -day pedestrian life. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is a uh, shock uh, to see what Singapore was exactly a year ago to what it is now. Yeah. Um, as I said, you, you, you feel the impact immediately because this place is so small and you know everyone very, very quickly. Um, and I've got friends who've been working from home who were in financial services, been working from home for about eight weeks now. Uh, and just just on Monday, we had uh, the lockdown extended by another month. Um, yeah. And uh, so, on the, in the pedestrian life, it's very peculiar. It's so so strange. It is not the Singapore that uh, we all know. Um, it's it's quiet on the streets. The, the the roads that are usually insanely, you know, busy and the traffic and human traffic and people. Uh, my my shop, my boutique is in, in is in, is on the edges of, on the fringes of Chinatown. Uh, mm -hmm. in a place called Tanjong Paga. And um, that's a buzzing place. That's a buzzing place. And my actual specific neighborhood is called Duxton Road, Duxton Road, Duxton Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and that place is just never, ever quiet, you know. But uh, I was there just yesterday and there's nothing, there's no one. It's a yeah. ghost town. It's, it's, it's a, 
my the neighborhood where my boutique is in is really really small but it's 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 a, it's a ghost at the moment it really and truly is um a ghost it's it's just um it's sad uh and then as soon as you become aware of that you know that hang on a second because all along i've been looking at businesses being impacted i've been looking at people you know and obviously holding out and uh and just you know, carrying on a day to day or whatever but then with each passing day and each passing week, you start hearing about businesses of like your, your friends' businesses. You start hearing about your neighbors' businesses. You start hearing about people you know who are not, uh, who, who, who are having to shut shop, you know, people in, who are running restaurants and clubs and bars and so on and so forth, right? And my neighborhood is very well known for that, really nice bars and restaurants, and they were the first to lock down. Uh, wow. Beautiful hotel, about 50 yards, 60 yards from my shop, uh, small boutique hotel, probably about a maybe 40 rooms, uh, or maybe less, uh, really upmarket hotel, like that closed, right? And that was a really good stream of uh, sort of walk in, walk by clients and new customers for myself. And when they closed, that's when I really started to feel the impact that, oh my God, this is actually really happening in my neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and then you start to really look around and everyone. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's actually looking pretty is, sad. Is there is there any form of maybe um, stimulus packages that the government has for small businesses in, in Singapore? Yeah, so they, they, the government has, has, has uh, kind of, again, this is what comes back to governance, right? They, they're really, really good at governance over here. So they have reassured a lot of businesses. They've been giving uh, a lot of uh, locally. So the, the, the one thing that you have to, a friend of mine was um, noting was that you, when you are a foreigner, and you're a business owner, a foreign business owner, you definitely feel the difference in the way governance is implemented. Um, so take, for example, they've in introduced very, very good and very, very uh, effective stimulus packages for business owners, but largely impacting positively local business owners, Singaporeans, as it should be, right? That's their government. They, they have to look after their citizens. Uh, so take, for example, the government has pledged, I think for the next six months to pay half of all the salaries of uh, people in uh, food and beverage industry, restaurants okay. and service industries that are on front line. So the government has pledged, I believe, 50% of their salaries, right? Uh, if, if they earn something like less than 3,000 a month, I think. Um, and they have also uh, enforced, the more, one of the strongest ones that they, they enforced was uh, something which they essentially branded as like a, a tax rebate to landlords. And the way that plays out is the, the government has said that they are not going to charge landlord property owners, right, uh, any tax, uh, but that tax relief has to be passed down to the tenants, people like such as myself. So take, for example, if somebody's occupying a very large uh, commercial property, if mm -hmm. the government, with the government having given them a tax release, it means that um, they can pass down that relief onto the tenant. So which, which could, in, in the best case scenario, it could mean a tenant not having to pay rent the equivalent of two or three months okay. in the best case scenario. But on average, it's it's turning out to be the equivalent of one month rent for free. And then also they've uh, told all landlords that irrespective of how, uh, of, of how tenants, foreign owned or locally owned businesses, irrespective of how far behind they are in paying their rent, uh, landlords are not allowed to evict anyone for the next six months. Okay. Yeah. I and you know, one thing though that you pointed out, and we're gonna get into um, the this the, the topic, is we touched on this a few weeks ago, maybe a few days ago, when it comes yeah. on to a foreigner living in a foreigner living in a country, whichever country you live in, yeah. and the um, how the foreigners are treated versus the natives, right? Yeah. Because in a pandemic like this, it's almost like the priority <laughs> level of foreigners is like maybe level number two or three and natives takes first place, right? So if you're a foreigner oh, yeah. country, it's like, you're just like, you just gotta just take what you get and just that's do right. it, right? So it's, that's, that's I guess that's one disadvantage of living overseas in a country that you're not like a native. That's um, right. We, we, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy time to be a foreigner. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right? it, re it really it really is. Um, and I think, again, it, it depends on your disposition, right? At the end of the day, financial impacts are, are, are really, as it, I'm feeling it, you know? So the financial impact of uh, of being a foreigner and owning a business and, 
you know, feeling the, the effects of, what, of something like this can be really, really scary, especially when you're, when you're on your own, if you're not married, if you don't have children, or uh, if you're literally just by yourself um, and you don't have a secondary income to, to support, you, you shut down and you, you do very much feel alone. And much more so in this circumstance because of the fact that you wouldn't even be allowed to travel and go back home, right? Yeah. In other circumstances, people would maybe experience the catastrophe of losing a business and going into $100,000 debt and so on and so forth is tragic. But you can pack up and go home and spiritually, emotionally, and mentally, that can make you kind of come back and, and recover, right? Uh, but imagine, and one thing I really feel for are people who are here as foreigners, uh, who own businesses and they're on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and they are essentially, yeah, uh, with stuck here, right? So let's say your business has collapsed, you're a foreigner, um, and you have maybe, yeah, no money left. Uh, that, that makes me, actually shudder quite a bit because as i said uh my business is definitely suffering uh last two two three months of uh, zero revenue right uh, i've got a very supportive client base who have uh, been pledging to make orders immediately as soon as this uh, lockdown is lifted they're calling it the circuit breaker here so as soon as the circuit breaker is is lifted i've, I've had several of my clients just saying hey i'll be the first through the door once uh, things level out, I'll be the first through the door to, to, to make an order. In fact, you know, so I'm going to be putting out some, so I've got, I'm, I'm lucky in a sense that, that emotionally and mentally, I've got family support. You know, my wife is here, my daughter's here. Uh, so the stress of my business, not uh, of the wheels in my business, not turning, I think is mitigated by spending a whole day laughing with a four-year-old, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. an overly energetic four-year-old. Um, yeah. Who, yeah. who, who, quite frankly, needs to be tranquilized, but never mind. <laughs> uh, well, but, only but, fathers understand. Only fathers it, understand, right? Oh, <laughs> my God. Exactly, exactly right. Fathers and daughters. Um, so, so, so in that regard, I do think uh, I, I feel the hardship, but I also extend my empathy to people who, friends of mine, close friends of mine, who have said are here on their own with businesses, and um, I know they're stuck. Yeah, it's it's a crazy time to be alive, right? Because it's like this is something that so many people weren't anticipating, like they weren't even prepared for it. This thing is so out of the pocket or out of the box that everyone was taken by surprise. It's like it doesn't matter how I guess only if you had like a lot of money put aside or you are in an industry that is unaffected by this, maybe online or something. Well, it depends. Even online, it depends what you're doing. Because if you're if you have an e-commerce store, it depends if people are buying or not, because they so might have money, so they're not buying, right? Yes, yeah, so right. even, even if they were buying logistics, everybody's logistics have been affected, right? So it's like the end, it's crazy. I'm just like the, the scale of this thing is just like, and I feel, of course, I'm not sure about the behind the scenes, but I'm like, man, this was almost self inflicted because it's the response to the pandemic. And in yes. my mind, of course, I'm not an expert, so I don't know. I'm like, man, it seems so drastic, it's almost like you're ruining your own economy. Yes. by taking certain measures right so that's one thing but then again i'm not an expert so i don't know but talk let's talk about uh black businesses within the community and because we spoke last night and you said that in times like these it yes. seems like black businesses are usually affected the most well right? yeah and, and i think it's uh so we'll, we'll take this from the angle of business right but mm -hmm. just to briefly touch on the actual fact that it it, it the deepest impact in business will be will be felt I believe by, uh, uh, especially in Western countries, I should emphasize that it's especially in Western countries, right? Mm. Uh, we mostly affect, it will mostly affect black owned businesses, right? But this also extends just to the broader general social fabric. If you ever look at uh, tragic, uh, let's say economic disasters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, recessions and so on and so forth, right? The thing is, the statistical information I do feel, especially in today's age, this is 2020, I do feel that there is now um, a, how can I say, a sort of an eggshell walk around mm -hmm. presenting statistics to do with the black community or, or communities of, of, of any minority in the West, right? Because I think uh, uh, institutions that have always govern, uh, conducted studies and whatnot have become weary of ever presenting any cold, hard facts in a, in a, in a cold, hard manner because um social justice especially online social justice means that a lot of experts are now mm -hmm. nervous about presenting statistical information about the fact that well we've observed that black people uh, like I, I was reading a, a, a really sad uh health report uh, about how in america for example 
the people who have who who, who bear the worst brunt of the medical services in America are black women, right? They are the most negatively impacted by by, by medical services in America, um, and when I was reading that article and that report, it was I could actually see why reports like that don't make it to the surface in a broader manner because um, the, the nature of uh, social media, the nature of open access media, and the nature of the fact that everybody has an opinion means that if you were to present, if if an expert who happens to, let's say, have, has gone to Johns Hopkins University, uh, specialized in socioeconomics within the black community, but that expert happened to be, let's say, I don't know, white or Hispanic or Indian, was conducting a study about the impact and the effects felt by black women in the medical industry, right? Social media means that a, a person like that today is very nervous and scared of presenting that information because they'd be seen as if they are part of the problem. They are, they're, they're proliferating and allowing and, you know, the problem. So uh, there's, a, there's an extraordinary amount of information uh, out there and statistics, uh, but it's also, being uh, censored because they're, the, the, the institutions that be are very scared of how they would be perceived if they were to pr pr produce information uh, like that. Like, for example, the statistical information surrounding, uh, for example, the, 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 the re in, in America, they call them foreclosures, but in England, they call it a repossession when you lose your house because you fail to keep up with the mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. right? And the statistics behind the repossessions within the black community were frightening. Right. They were just shocking in comparison to other communities, right? Uh, but again, this is information you are hardly going to hear about for a, for, for a multitude of reasons, right? But I do think that in the last five years, it's because of, of the social, of the reactive nature of social justice, right? Uh, especially on, on social media. Um, but let's come back to black, the black businesses. I do think that um, in the West, there is going to be, I think, uh, an, uh, a blood a bloodbath of sorts of, of of black businesses, as there was during the two thousand eight uh, economic uh, recession, right? Okay. Because um, we, and I'm looking at this by the way, just to make anyone else watching this uh, aware. I'm looking at this through the lens of uh, the British uh, system, not necessarily the American, but I do think there are parallels uh, with mm -hmm. the American system. So, looking at it through the British system, you find that uh, we have. Um, Poor access to to things like financial business loans. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, a, a sort of, at least in 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 the way things are manifest themselves by the way we operate our businesses, we don't have the same level of uh, business literacy and business the, the, the fine the fine print of operating businesses. Right, uh, people will operate a, a really successful, uh, let's say, Jamaican takeaway food business right only to realize that there was a certain fine print that they didn't realize that meant they needed a certain license to operate in a certain capacity right uh so those those small the fine print sometimes we we tend to suffer from those things a lot more and i do think that it's it, it's a multitude of reasons but i like to look at reasons that are to do with more how we as a community operate mm. right uh, and i'll start with the, the simple fact that information dissemination in our community is not great Right. And remember, be reminded, I'm talking about I'm talking about this about this from the angle um, and perspective of someone who's grown up in Britain. Um, but I also do think and I'm very well invested in American uh, uh, politics in, about, uh, of the African-American community. Uh, in, in, and I do think there are such close par parallels. So let's start with information dissemination is really poor uh, within our community when people open a business um and they start operating two three years into it right and another mm -hmm. friend maybe i don't know if it's a friend let's say a stranger who just wants to run a business as well says hey can you help me navigate these waters because i've got these forms and how do i go to come you know, to company's house to register my company do i need a lawyer for this do i need a lawyer for that and so on and so forth uh black people will set up successful businesses but as i say the information filter is just not great for two reasons one uh, there's that hold your cards close to your chest uh, mentality, right? But two, there is also, broadly speaking, uh, just, I think, the idea of fear, right? Uh, the idea of like, oh, you know, it's, 
I, I grew up in, I'm saying this from personal experience, I grew up around hearing a lot, like observing, let's say, a, a black person was, was open to a very successful business. Mm -hmm. And I would hear all too often other people saying, wow, you know, sometimes you just don't know how people did it. And I would say, well, what if it was just a straightforward go to company's house, register your company name, um, in, in maybe inject a bit of like maybe 10,000 pounds into your business and then start operating. And they say, well, no, 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 that's not possible. Look, look, I mean, at that level of success, like he has to have done, he, he, he did something else. You know, um, uh, she, there was something else at play here. I'm like, well, maybe not. Maybe it was just pure, uh, you know, drive and, and the brawn of just saying, you know what, I, I, I did my homework, did my research, you know, but there's a skepticism all too often amongst us about how, uh, about, uh, there's a skepticism amongst us about a successful person who looks like us, but we're not, we don't offer the same skepticism about anyone else who looks different from us. Okay, 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 yeah. You know? um, and then, like I said, let's reverse back to this, the, the, the economic impact is that historically anyway, black businesses and black business owners have always had a hard time getting access to business loans. They've always had a hard time um, on, on the same level playing field, right? Uh, and you can put that to the, the immediate knee jerk uh, kind of, um, you know, compass points to institutional racism that definitely exists, uh, not least evidenced by uh, a few years ago in the UK, there was a case about how the inland revenue had discovered a small ring of uh, the, the, the inland revenue uh, tax office in the UK, a small ring of people who had deliberately, in the UK every year, you could do tax reclaim if you've been overtaxed. And the small ring inside the inland revenue had deliberately um, stifled tax rebates to people of color and people of ethnic minority and mm -hmm. overcompensated British nationals, right, on their tax rebate claims. And I was one of those victims. So that's why I know this. Oh, right? yes, you told me this story. I just remembered you told me the story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was one of those people who I remember just thinking, I'm a student. Why am I being taxed 30 percent? Right. Uh, and later on, it turned out there was a small ring of people within inland revenue who had uh, been deliberately uh, suffocating uh, certain, certain avenues of, you know, so when things like that happen, uh, you, you, you find yourself working very, very hard, but somehow you're constantly grappling and your, 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 your progress is uh, very slow. You know, so this is why I always think that in, it's times like these to touch on what we, uh, what we discussed yesterday. It's times like these that we and to, 2020 is very different from 2008 by the way right 2008 you have to remember there was no instagram there was there was only facebook but social media was nowhere near what it is today there were no live streams on youtube um there was essentially where we are right now and this is me it, it, back to my optimistic uh you know rhythm is that we are today at exactly the same point as the print revolution of the 1600s, right? This is the digital revolution, and this is not any, like, it's, it's not a small thing. We are literally at the beginning. We're 20 years into the 21st century, which makes me feel so old. Oh, my God. <laughs> we are 20 years into the 21st century. And so, we, after all, you're 79, sir. You're 79. <laughs> We, 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 we are 20 years into the 21st century, and the 21st century is, as I say to you, the last 20 years have been what I imagine it was when the printing press was invented in the 1650s, the 17th century, when the printing press came out, right? It leveled and flattened the power structure, the power dynamic, the information dissemination uh, dynamic. People, the, the average layman who, who never had access to the Bible suddenly could pick it up and read it themselves. You know, um, and this is where we are today. This is why I say that the the current situation and climate is very different from 2008. We can be more forgiving when we say that social media was not as powerful in 2008. Information didn't move as fast as, as back then, but that's 12 years ago. Today, uh, if we were to look at things from the lens of the success or failure of black businesses, right, we are at the forefront of actually being able to access info an, an, an unprecedented level of information mm -hmm. which can empower people, right? Much more than it did in 2008, okay. right? Um, people now can be extraordinarily empowered because there is information about everything. Like there's, there's nothing you can't know. There's no information and no knowledge that you can't know if you are really inquisitive enough. I'll give you an example. Right. I'll give you, I, talk, I was talking about reports, reading reports just a few minutes ago. 
And uh, one of my, my, my favorite author, and he, he will always be right up there in the top three of my favorite authors. I know that he, some people don't necessarily see him this way, but it's Malcolm Gladwell. Simply because uh, one of his books emancipated my, 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 my mm -hmm. mind. And so I have, a, I have a personal investment in Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, He's a genius, genius. Even, so even if he ever became a re Republican, I feel like I have no choice, but like that he owns a piece of my soul, <laughs> right? But um, the reason I bring him up is because, in, in conjunction with the idea of information access, mm -hmm. is his favorite website is a website called ssrn.com or okay. .org. I don't know, yeah, ssrn.org. That is an extraordinary platform. Visually, it is boring as <laughs> looking at paint drying visually. But if Malcolm Gladwell can uh, vouch for that website, I've been on it and I read some papers on there. And just from that one website, I repeat that there is just no excuse to turn around and say, I didn't know, right? I urge anyone right now watching, go on ssrn.com or .org, right? Um, and uh, ssrn, just double check. Yeah, dot .com, yeah, ssrn.com, right? It has almost 1 million published papers by academics across, I repeat, almost 1 million papers, essays published, right? There is everything from, uh, and, in there, you will find things that are specific to the black community. There are studies there about uh, the impact of education on black children, the impact of uh, the medical industry on, on, on black women. Uh, the, the, there are essays there about uh, the imprisonment rates of black people, some that uh, is that corroborates the disproportionate incarceration, some of it which argues against it. There, there is just an, all of these are just academic objective papers, right? Okay. And and so do, and, and with that as well, there's access to papers and essays on there about economic empowerment, right? There are people who have written essays about how people can extract themselves from. So information is out there. That's why I say that 2020 is an entirely different game for, for what has been largely a marginalized and severely discriminated community such as ours, right? Anyone today who wants to rise up, it will not happen overnight. It is not going to happen overnight, right? But we are literally at the beginning or in the, I want to say in the middle of, because I do think that the current digital revolution is in its infancy. So we are at the forefront at the infancy of a digital revolution. And like Gil Scott Harrell said, the revolution will not be televised. You are going to live in the revolution. And when a revolution is happening around you, you don't feel it, which is why a lot of people, a lot of like, you know, social kind of like, you know, uh, intellectuals will always say, be woke. I hate using that word, right? But I think that's what being woke is. It's about the fact that being aware of what you are living in. And for me, there's a certain level of liberty that I feel in being aware of the fact that I'm living in an age where I can sit on this desk here and spend four hours reading uh, some extraordinary information, which somebody can put, you have to remember that where the agenda lies is in the media. Right? The, me the media definitely has an agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have objective information that can empower you to improve your circumstance, right, you look at things like SSRN, right? Uh, and that's just one tiny dot of a drop in an, in an ocean of many, many other sources. Information sources are infinite today. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one, one thing, too, is uh, it's the appetite, right? I, I talk about this all that's the time right. yeah. for the individual because some people might not like doing things like that they might not have the appetite to consume you know that type of information right they're like ah i'm not into that and so i'll say this to that like, how do you get people like how do you get people like you just mentioned malcolm gladwell one of my favorite authors too as well as robert green i yes. him, he's another That's one right. as well. and um when you think about it some people don't even care about reading books or reading anything or researching anything right they're like, yep. just like i'm not but how do you get someone at a, at a place where they have an appetite or how do you develop someone's appetite for something else that can aid them in furthering their you know their purposes or life or a uh, position i don't know I, I i will paraphrase an old cliche which is you can take a mule uh, you can take a mule to the well but you can't make him drink right um so i do think that when people don't have an appetite for such things and i as i say this i'm talking to myself as well right mm -hmm. is that whenever you don't have an appetite if somebody says to you there over there uh lies 
uh, this um, this amount of information about, let's say, I don't know, uh, property development. Uh, over yeah. there lies this amount of information about the cryptocurrency investment. Uh, over there lies information about um, understanding how to to uh, would, uh, buy a life insurance policy, right? If somebody points those things out to me as happens every single day, right? Uh, somebody points that information out to, uh, to me and I don't engage it, that's my responsibility. I'm at fault here. So no one, you say, how can you make people develop the appetite? You can't make people develop the appetite. You can't. You can only point out the sources of information, but you cannot make them do anything, right? So, so finish your thought. Uh, uh, so, so in that regard, we are all, all you can do is illuminate, is tell people. Uh, if people don't want to be enlightened, then it's entirely, uh, their own responsibility. I'm a big advocate for the, you know, like I once heard this this guru say that um, the greatest favor, the greatest service, favor you could do to humanity is your own self enlightenment, right? Uh, if you look at it philosophically, we are all at the service of the universe. We are all at the service. The most fulfilled lives are lives that are lived in service, right? And service can be interpreted in so many different ways, right? Um, but the greatest way to fulfill one's own life is to be is to pursue your own self enlightenment. And if you refuse to do that, then you don't have an excuse to say that, oh, sorry, I didn't have this information, I didn't have access to that. Okay, because, okay, so I guess, so I guess that's the approach then. The approach is to do your part, present the information, yeah. um, seek to enlighten, and yes. if someone doesn't want to receive the enlightenment, then you move on to someone who wants to. Uh, someone said at one point, they were given this, uh, what was it? Uh, they were talking about a presentation. And they're saying within any cohort, you have different people, different mindsets, someone who's going to laugh at the presentation, someone yep. who's going to be perplexed, right, as a result result of the presentation, yeah. someone who's going to take it in and say, yep. okay, they're going to ponder it. So in every group, you will have people who are of different dispositions and they will respond to your, your presentation differently. So I guess Absolutely. you can never get everyone on the same page. Um, and I guess, but that's one of the things, though, when we look at the, the issues that ail our community, the question is, like, how do you get more people off a certain mindset so we can move things forward? Or should we just present information, leave it there, and those who want to be engaged, get engaged and do something about it? Is at, at, at the risk of at the risk of over of sound like I'm oversimplifying a really, really deep seated uh, problem. At mm -hmm. the risk of sound like I'm oversimplifying, um, we should lead by example. Okay. Right. People only emulate a good example. So when we talk at people, you know, when you keep saying to them, oh, you go and read, go and read, please take this information and read, people disengage. You know, people lean back, like, oh, come on. You're, 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 essentially, what you're doing is you're overselling there, and people become suspicious and they become uh, uh, uninterested. Right. Yeah. So the only thing you can do is lead by example. Right. What's the example that you can set? Right. To ensure and illustrate to your fellow man that this is what they should be doing, right? So rather than, t rather than telling them what they should be doing, you should be showing them what you're doing. And if what you're doing is the right thing, they will emulate. Okay. okay. I think that's really and truly, as I said. I think, no, definitely. I think that that's, that's more subtle. And I think um, yeah. we won't um, come up against like a resistance, right? Because just like you said, you said it. Um, people will be resistant, especially if you're saying to them, look, you have to do this. Because the, the truth of the matter is no one has to do anything. No, <laughs> right? nobody it's, has to. You're right. So they, they have to make a, a decision to do something or engage in a certain activity. Exactly. And they have the value in that, right? And the need for it as well for them to do it. And as I said, like, for instance, yourself, you said you were reading uh, from, for, uh, for, for a very long time. You know, were studying all these things because you had, like, for some reason, whatever sparked your interest, you had an inquisitive mind from a long time. Some people may have a different mind, right? Where yeah. they're not into that type of thing. They're like, no, this is what they're drawn to. So even, I guess some of us might be predisposed to certain things. I'm not sure why, yes. um, but yeah. that within this separation there as well, right? Yeah, so, I, I, I do um, think well, yeah, that's, that's actually a much more complex one. Yeah, it is hard to figure <laughs> out why some of us are more, as you say, predisposed to inquiring about something in a particular line over it might be about you. It might be genetics and it might be, um, for instance, my daughter, uh, your dad as well, your daughter and my daughter are almost the same age. I think a year. Yeah, yeah right? your, your daughter is one year older, yeah. yeah. So with 
with my daughter, what my wife had, had done, um, she started reading to her from she was in the her like womb, right? She yeah. started reading stories to her from that time. Oh wow! And uh, playing a certain type of music. And now my daughter, she's reading a lot. She would literally read. Right now, she's reading the we have a Japanese dictionary, so she would read the Japanese word and look for the English um, translation. So she would say, "Oh, this is in Japanese, yeah. And yeah. English." That and she's five, right? And she's writing stories. She's doing all these things. But my oh, wow. wife spent like every single day. She hasn't missed a day. The routine that she has, she does it every single time. And yeah. I think that within itself has left an indelible mark in my daughter's mind because she has built that foundation for the first five years, even before she exited the womb. Yeah. So I feel maybe that might have something to do with it. Did you have a childhood like that? But I know that's not the only thing. That's not the only thing. Let me just yeah, say. That's right. Yeah, so let's, let's clarify that. That's not the only thing. Yeah, you're right. Even for me, my mom, um, she said I was, I was reading all the time. I was one of those nerdy kids in the corner reading a book when everyone is reading. <laughs> but for, I don't know, I can't say where that came from because she never like, I don't know if she gave me books. Or, she was a teacher as well, but I can't remember her giving me a book, but she said I was always drawn to that for some reason. So maybe it might be something that we can't even pinpoint and point to that this is the reason why someone is a certain way. Yes. You, and, you, and, and, and you know, the, the thing is um, when you, I, I'm completely with you on, on there, right? In the sense that there are so many things that you can't explain uh, why, like, like the other day. Uh, um, so one thing I do, uh, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I should say this, but anyway, I, uh, one thing I do is I write letters to my daughter. I've been writing them to her before, since before she was born. That's amazing. You told me. <laughs> right. So I've been writing her letters since before she was born. And uh, just two days ago, I wrote her the most recent one um, because she officially learned how to read just three days ago. Okay. Right? okay. In, like, nice. We've been reading to her ever since, you know, uh, before she her own time starts, whatever, right? Um, and reading her stories, like she cannot go to bed without a story. But the funny thing about her is that she insists that the story you tell her has to be a made up story about a lost child. Okay. <laughs> she, she, she calls them lost stories. So you have to tell her a lost story about a child. And she likes to be kind of tentatively woven into the story, but not too closely. She doesn't like okay. the character to be too close to her. Anyway, okay, okay. <laughs> so the other, because to answer your question about, is it, are you predisposed to certain things? Well, so I wrote this letter to her, the most mm -hmm. recent one. I showed it to my wife. I said, oh, can you just read this? I just want to know how it sounds, right? And it's funny. I've written a bunch of letters so far. I've never asked my wife to look at them. But it's only that one letter the other day I asked her to read. And the only thing after reading is she looked at me. She goes, how do you write like that? <laughs> right? I said, what do you mean? She's like, I can't write like this. How do you write like that? Right? Uh, she said, that's why all the writing is left to you and the family. And so it's interesting how for her, she sees that the way I write, she thinks that I write in such a way that she can't understand. As in, she just finds it too, she's, she's like, you write too well for me to understand. I can't, she's, she's an academic, right? She's a teacher herself. She's an academic. She's very well, incredibly well-spoken and whatnot, but she definitely yeah. can't write like me. And I don't say that as a bragging point, but she just does say like, I just don't have the same execution and command of words in, in the way that you write, you know? So she was like, ah, you're annoying, whatever. Here you go. Let us find. Is it like a gift then? Like maybe one of those things that you would just say, you know, what, it's a gift. Or I, I like to, I, I like to, to go back to Malcolm Gladwell. I, I like to take a Gladwellian approach to this, right? Mm -hmm. I do think there are some things that are in people uh, by let's say nature, right? There are some things that are in people by nature. However, mm -hmm. Uh, even if it is absent in you. So take, for example, you find two kids. One is a brilliant runner, naturally. And the other one just is, doesn't, doesn't run that well. The thing mm -hmm. is, any natural talent, any natural talent can be laid to waste if it isn't honed, if it mm -hmm. isn't cultivated and fine-tuned and harnessed, right? And that's the Gladwell approach, right? Where uh, in, 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 in the Outliers, he, talks, he, he exemplifies the story of the boy going to the dentist and then the little girl who's a natural singer, right? The boy going to the dentist, uh, his mother, as they're in the, in the car, is saying, to her, is saying to him, can you come up with, can you start thinking about questions that you want to ask the dentist uh, when you get there? Because he's looking at your teeth and not my teeth. I can't speak for you, right? So I need mm -hmm. you to think about what you want to ask the dentist and, and so on and so forth. And Michael Gladwell notes that as he walks into the dentist's office, right, uh, the boy who's only seven years old, mm -hmm. by virtue of his mother empowering him to say, you take charge of this appointment because they are your teeth, right? The boy walks into that dentist's office with an entirely different demeanor, right? Uh, and the most notable thing was that his mother's empowerment of the boy taking charge of the appointment meant that the boy uh, 
mentally and psychologically diminished the authority barriers between him and the dentist, which empowered him to be able to relate to the dentist on a, on a certain level of, of mutual kind of understanding. And mm -hmm. the most important thing to note there, to really note how effective that empowering was, was the fact that the seven-year-old boy at that point had enough confidence to crack a joke with the dentist. It may seem like nothing, but you have to think about it like this. For a seven-year-old child to, to be able to have the presence of mind to crack a joke with a stranger, right, takes an immense level of self-empowerment and self-awareness that his mother had imbued him. Now, take, for example, the girl who was, I think she was 12 years old in the book, right? And uh, she's a singer. She's naturally a singer. The mother works a lot. The mother is, you know, doing night shifts and so on and so forth. And uh, a psych the psychologist who was studying them said to her, who was following them, said to her, your daughter's a natural singer. What are you doing about her talent? And the mother said, what do you want me to do about it? All right? Uh, she, she's a natural singer and hey, I mean, I encourage her to, you know, maybe go to a local club or whatever, maybe sing there, but ultimately it's her gift. What can I do about it? Right. And so that illustrates, and she, the, the psychologist notes that the more she, as, as she followed the family over time, right, you realize that the little girl with this incredible talent in her, mm -hmm. she had no guidance. She had nothing to, she couldn't do anything with it. Right, because she didn't, she wasn't directed in a certain way. Whereas this boy, who by all accounts is probably just an average middle class boy, uh, and he noted he came from an upper middle class background, right, uh, was probably just an, a, a standard, generally clever child, but not very, not overly clever. But mm -hmm. the way his parents talked to him, the way his parents treated him, and the level of accountability, and this is a key thing, the level of individual accountability coupled with guidance from his mother meant that he will mentally and intellectually grow up to be very, very... So the boy was from an upper middle class family and the girl was from a work poor work class family. And as I'm reading this, right, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, poor little black girl. And then I was looking at the story of that boy and I was like, this is exactly why white kids are so empowered, right? But what I loved about the end of that story was that Michael Gladwell reveals that the boy, the upper middle class boy was actually a black kid and the talented working class girl was a white girl. Okay, I see. And I the see. illustration there was that it had nothing to do with race. It was more about what you do to the mind and the resources that the individual has access to. Yeah, access, as you said, access. Access is a big Access to resources it, is fundamental. It, it is. It's a massive, like, yeah. yeah that access. And that's, why, and that's why I say that today we all have access to every single resource. Any kind of argument that, oh, well, yeah, white kids are given a higher advantage and uh, Indian kids are given a great advantage, Chinese kids have, what they have are stronger centralized economic pools. That much is unarguable, right? Uh, uh, the, like, for example, in the West, if you look at Western societies, the Chinese community has a very, you know, and this is obviously a very broad brushstroke. Not all of them operate like this, but generally speaking, there is a tighter communal spirit where, um, they, they, there's they're insular, right? The Indian community is also the same, right? Uh, that that insulation of helping each other naturally, whereas, uh, and that's what empowers them. That's exactly mm -hmm. what empowers a lot of them, right? In the sense that they know that if things are adverse on the outside in the in in this in this in this uh, host country that we are inhabiting, yeah. we're in a host country, and if things are hostile, by virtue of uh, the actions of the natives, then. Mm -hmm. Within our community, we have a support system. And I'll give you a really good example, which is literally one month old. No, in fact, no, this example I think is two weeks old. I read an article in the New York Times uh, right. the other day about this um, Bangladeshi man, 56 years old, and he died from the coronavirus, right, in New York. And he was a yellow cab driver. And uh, he's, he has basically left three children orphaned, right, the youngest of whom is, uh, I think, eight years old. Okay. Right. And the, the, the eldest boy is 20 years old. And uh, the second one is, I think, 17 or 18 years old. And then the youngest one is a little girl who is uh, eight years old. And what was amazing about this was this, it, it, the idea of, again, of an insular community, the, uh, having a, the pillar that you can always turn to. So these three children are now orphaned. Right. Their father has been uh, a taxi driver. The mother died four years ago from uh, cancer. Right. Um, so they were they're literally on their own. 
And uh, this boy was saying that basically the man was very poor, but what he did was he found out a program uh, in, in New York that gave access to poor children to enter very, very expensive, prestigious schools on scholarships. And uh, all three of them are now enrolled, or as in the brothers now, the eldest brother is 20 years old, is now at Harvard, by the way, okay. right? Younger brother, I think, is also following in hot, hot, hot on the heels of Harvard. Then the youngest sister, who's seven, eight years old, um, is now at a primary school called Trinity, which is supposed to be one of the most expensive and most uh, illustrious and most you know prestigious schools. And you, a, 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 on average, kid from their background would never know of that school. But their mm-hmm. dad streamlined them into getting into that uh, access route of education, right? He was from Bangladesh, very poor man, but he always insisted his children get access through scholarships to those best schools. Now, within a week of the father dying and the news going out there, right, that uh, their father had died and they were effectively orphaned, and this little girl is now at risk of being taken by social services, as, as happens in America, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think in 10 days, uh, one of the eldest brothers, the Harvard brother, right, uh, one of his friends set up a GoFundMe page, and in less than 10 days, they raised a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Right? That, coupled with the fact that the Bangladeshi community in New York, who knew this man, have rallied behind these three children and they're now supporting them. Um, and I think within our community, we have those things. We have those things for sure, uh, but they need to be much more, I think, systemized because a lot of the frustration that ends up happening uh, with people who look like us, but find themselves struggling and they, find, they feel alone is that, as I said, the access to the resources that are insular to us are not there. Centralized, centralized resources are really lacking in our community. Okay. So, okay. What, okay. So the title is, um, I believe post COVID-19 realities for the black community. Yes. So how can we, in your opinion, you know, like how can we come out on the other side, right? Like yes. stronger, like especially small businesses, um, like as a community, how can we emerge? As you said, you know, usually in times like these, we suffer the most, Yes. right? How can we, we, we come out of this, um, stronger on the other side. Okay. First of all, I do think that let's say if, let's start on a really, really micro scale, right? But like some uh, practical, practical things. Yeah, as yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Very, very practical things, right? On a very, very micro scale, if you own a business um, and you are struggling, right? And you, you're in trouble, you're a black business owner, let's say you're on a high street of England and you own a hairdresser and you're struggling, right? The one thing is open yourself up to first of all, your customers, your clients, your first and foremost, your clients, if you're something like a hairdresser, right, uh, you're going to know all your clients personally, right? Rally their support. It may not be financial to begin with, right? But rally their support to sort of say, hey, listen, you know, uh, I need I need help. Because we're not good at saying that. That's one thing I have to say. We're not good at saying, I need help. Okay. That's the first thing you have to say. I need help, right? I'm on my own out here and I'm struggling and I need help. That's one. Number two, much, much more practically, read on your financial and business literature, depending on your jurisdiction of where you are. Like, for example, like I said, I had a moment of panic and, jitter, uh, and jitters when uh, you know, business started slowing down, revenue was crashing, and, what, and my landlord was still sending me the, 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 the rental invoices. And I'm looking at them thinking, oh my God, how do I pay this rent if uh, the, 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 the landlord is demanding that I still pay the rent, even though he's aware my landlord yeah. owns a lot of the properties on my na- in my neighborhood. So even though he's aware that all the businesses that he owns, whose properties that he owns, have, have shut down, he's still asking us for rent. So I had a moment of panic. And then I stopped myself. And I was like, hang on a second. Why am I panicking? Because to panic is to absorb yourself in an emotional reaction and you lose all sense of rationale. So as I said to you, the government here is brilliant at information dissemination. And I do think Western governments as well are very good at information dissemination. So you have to literally spend that extra two, three hours at the end of the night and read your business literature. What are you entitled to? What are your protections as a business owner, as a small business? And if you are too anxious to go through those pages and pages, right, there are always set, like you can call a governing body and say, hey, listen, I'm a struggling. Like in England, I know that local councils are brilliant at supporting people, right? So pick up the phone and call and say, I'm a small business owner. What do I do? if I can't pay my rent and my landlord is is banging on my door saying, I'm going to shut you down, I'm going to shut you down. So once I read my literature, 
right? I calmed down and I realized that, okay, even though I don't like the idea of being in arrears of any sort whatsoever, I also mm -hmm. know that the government has, by law, right, by law enforced the protection on every business to say that I am not going to be evicted within six months of this current crisis. So I've got a six month window, even though to myself and give to myself, I've got three months, I've got a three month window within which to develop a strategy to get sales to pick up again and to engage my suppliers, right? And in, in having that info, informative uh, relief in my mind allows me to clear space. The, ang the anxiety moves away and it clears space for me to start actually drafting really pragmatic, strategic things. Like I'm gonna set out, send out, start sending out uh, emails to my clients one by one and saying to them, hey, this is what's happening. And be on, if, if the government's open with us, I'm open with my clients say, this is what's happening, right? And I also engage my suppliers. And that's the third thing that you have to do, right? So after rallying support from your, from your own client base, after reading your business literature, now start looking at your suppliers. Look at your supply chain, right? And they could, because they too, this is, this is a blanket effect on everybody, right? So you are not on your own. I think that's, the, that's one of the only consoling factors about this is that anyone suffering is not suffering alone. Your yeah. entire, so everybody's entire supply chain is affected. So look at your supply chain as I have been for the last two weeks, right? I'm looking at all my supply chain. So my manufacturers, my fabric suppliers, um, and anybody else in between there who is a supplier. I have been contacting them. And first and foremost, just engaging them on a personal level. How are you? How are things looking? Is business working for you? And they, I know what they're going to say. Say, hey, dude, no, nothing's happening. We're all struggling and we've been shut down for the last two weeks and so on and so forth. And in that moment, what I do is just I listen. Like, for example, in my old neighborhood, right? I haven't seen or spoken to most of my uh, former neighbors in my old neighborhood of my business, right? But I have been texting a lot of them that I used to talk to a lot. How are you doing? And we've just been engaging on a personal level, first and foremost. Are you okay? Are you, are you struggling? And you relate to their, to their strife. When you do that, they know they've got your ear. And then if they are your supplier, they'll say, hey, you know what, man? I've got a surplus of this black fabric over here. And seeing as I'm not trading, I can give it to you a 15% discount, right? And I'll say to them, okay, I'll pledge to purchase this at 15% discount. And I'll pledge to purchase a minimum of 10 meters of this, right? Mm -hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll carry that over, take that 10 meters, and I'll talk to my shirt manufacturer and say, hey, listen, I know that uh, you don't like reducing your prices over here. They don't like negotiating our prices. Like price is a price, <laughs> right? However, we are all in the same boat. It's not like I'm calling you to ask for a favor for myself. You're suffering because you've got no business. I'm suffering because I've got no business. So I've been given a 15% discount on this. How about you give me a 15% discount that I can, on, on the, next, the next three months, right? Every time I make at least 25 shirts with you, you give me a 15% uh rebate and, and reduction on the cost right then that way i pass on that 15 percent discount to my clients once things get back on the road so right there you are creating a chain domino knock-on effect with everybody right but you have to engage people offer them something offer your suppliers uh, an opportunity to collaborate with you because it's very very easy to feel victimized by all of this it's very very easy to feel alone and essentially put a blanket over your head or a towel over your head and just say, I'm suffering, I'm suffering, right? That's when I believe your suppliers, your landlord and, and your customers are gonna come down heavy on you. Hey, you haven't delivered my, my, my products on time. Hey, where's the rent? Hey, uh, you haven't paid the invoice for this uh, last order and so on and so forth, right? That's when you feel the strife. But if you open yourself up to your suppliers, tell your customers, I'm, as I am right now, um, I've got a two, three month delay on the orders right now because of the fact that uh, my suppliers have been shut. You're all aware of this. And the thing is, they know it, but just you telling them, taking the initiative to write to them and say so, right, is exactly why they will turn around and say, hey, dude, Q, don't, don't worry about it. We understand. Just tell me when things are back in order. Uh, take your time with the order. It's of, and I've had a lot of my clients saying, listen, man, my clothes, you delivering my clothes is of such little priority. I'm more concerned with you staying afloat, right? So how about I make another purchase? I'm like, how would you make another purchase? I haven't even delivered the last one. They say, don't worry about that. Can I make another purchase just to give you a little bit of relief, right? So when you are open to your customers, right, they end up giving you more support. And then that also traverses and transpires onto your suppliers. If you're open with them, instead of saying, hey, listen, I've had an 80% crash in sales. But in order for us to mitigate this, maybe 
give me a 20% discount on product on production prices for the next three months. Okay. All right. So that's, that's, those are my, that's my advice. I think okay, well, before that, um, I have a follow up question, but before that, um, so those of you guys who are watching, if you have, have not yet subscribed, please consider doing so you guys understand this is the official live streaming channel. So it's different from the main channel, just so you guys know, right? So if you're watching this, some people are confused sometimes. They're like, wait, is this a different channel? Mm -hmm. This is strictly live streaming. So if you're watching on this channel, please remember to subscribe. The button is right down there below. And I'll also send you a link, um, at the end of this, so you can go and watch Q's interview on the Melanated Files, that series, you can check that out as well. Uh, one question I have for you, Q, as well, is like, so, okay, so on the other side, what can people do going forward to, like, okay, like, what you're saying right now is something that can be implemented. Um, mm -hmm. I guess another thing, too, to safeguard ourselves from something like this going forward is maybe going online, right? Like, strictly mm -hmm. online if it's possible. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. To, like, to minimize um, overhead costs, especially now when e-commerce is like one of the, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a, the way forward. Um, yes. Even though Amazon is really like, you know, just like beating everyone left, right, and yeah, center. Yeah, Amazon is dominating, yes. Yeah, it's, it's the way to, uh, it's the way forward. But what can we do to safeguard ourselves? As I said earlier, many people weren't expecting this. This thing was so... I think it took the world by surprise, man. I yeah, feel like yeah. so many people went bankrupt. So many things... Like, it's, I don't know... It's unprecedented, yeah. right? So I guess, so safeguarding ourselves from something like this in the future, this was so unprecedented and unexpected that I don't even think we could anticipate such a catastrophe, if we if you can in, say in, that. In the same way as nobody anticipated the 2008 crisis. But I think this is even worse. And this is like, I feel like the level of this thing is just the way it rolled out. You can't even travel. Like there's so yeah, many things like, true. as you said, the supply chain supply chains are affected, but how can we... As, as a black community, um, a yes. lot of small businesses, yes. um, maybe not as much support. Yes. How can, what can they, we do as a community going forward to maybe make ourselves, I don't even know if we can say recession proof or at least be more insulated. Yeah. In, okay. I, 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 um, yeah. I think this for me is a, is a brilliant opportunity for two things. One, you talked about going online, right? Mm. Absolutely. This, this, this is going to be the, 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 Springboard, yeah. urgent. Yeah. Yeah. Went bankrupt. Yeah. Then he's, uh, he's saying people, no one has went bankrupt yet. People have went gone bankrupt, even in Japan. A lot yeah. of places have actually shut down. So, like, yeah, yeah. So, so as I said about going online, right? I think uh, this should allow people to realize the opportunity, as you said, that of of limiting your your overhead costs. Take for example, if you live in a three bedroom apartment, you're a couple and you have one child, etc., right? Mm -hmm. And you're running a business that can that sells accessories. Uh, sacrifice one room and turn it into into your warehouse, right? Uh, if it's a, it's a, if it's a, if it's a non-perishable good, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of shipping, instead of shipping from somewhere else, a, a warehouse where you rent from. Yes, it's centralizing. Yes, it's easier. But you know what? Uh, to reduce your overhead costs, bring your warehouse into your house, right? Uh, if you're selling small goods and so on and so forth, right? That's one. Number two, and much much more complicated. This is much more complicated, but this should remind our community of how of how rare and mm. how how much of a shortage there is of centralized institutions and governing bodies that specialize and have a a a, a unique insight into black communities like in america like in england and so on and so forth that have a unique insight into the things that affect I know that some, some of my non-black friends always say to me, why do you have to separate it into a race thing? And I always say that I know it seems like it seems uh, separatist of us to say that, but actually it's simply because when you are an other in somebody else's country, the natives will never understand why you have a sense of separation about yourself, right? Because they've never, they've, they've never felt other. They're at home. How can they felt like an, how can they feel like an other? Right. Yeah. So what this should should, should really uh, bring to, to light is that uh, black people need to demand of themselves institutions that are representative of them, specifically mm -hmm. representative of them and the issues that they encounter. And there have been many attempts, by the way, this is not like it's something new. There have been many attempts and they have been thwarted by uh, governing institutions. Right. Because there is this fear 
uh, or there is just always this disdain of observing the black community actively trying to economically empower itself, right? There, there has, this is, as I said, uh, this is something I'm very aware of with reading literature. Best example is Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Uh, read up about that. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street, read up about what happened there. And that would illustrate to you the fear, the deep-seated fear that a lot of Western economies have always had about black people being economically self-sufficient, right? Um, that they, they, there's a massive what, paranoia around that. What, so, what we, okay. okay. So I think we have to demand and create. There have to be centralized institutions. Like for example, for me, I get frustrated by the fact that um, a, a lot of the time, younger black kids, right, who come from the same place I came from, still don't know where to get a business loan. Right now, there are central banks as normal, right? But how many African Americans know that there are sixty-five banks in America? Is it sixty-five or thirty-five? I hope I'm right. I hope it's sixty-five. But let's just be safe and say thirty-five. There are thirty-five private banks in America owned by Black people. How many Black people know that? Right. Indeed. So, and this is going to sound like I'm chastising my own community, but I'm going to lay it out there for a second. I read a quote the other day saying that uh, a guy who said. Um, 90% of us know more about Kim and Kanye, uh, Kanye West's life than we do about the fact that in 1999, the United States government paid in compensation and admitted that they had a role in assassinating Malcolm Luther King. Ma Martin Luther King, sorry. Right? In 1999, the US government paid out Martin Luther King's family in acknowledgement of the fact that the CIA had a hand in Martin Luther King's assassination. So 90% of us know more about Kanye West's business uh, and, and rants, right, than we do about that simple fact. That's problematic. That's troublesome. I go back to saying we have no excuse to be uninformed, right? So going forward, we need to be much, much more informed about things that are relevant to us, things that impact you. Be financially literate. Understand in America, okay, so, so, for example, African Americans, I would think that this should alert African Americans to be aware of the fact that 80% in, how, how is it that 80% of the deaths in there was a state in America where black people were 20% of the population, but 80% of the corona deaths, the coronavirus deaths were black people, but the black community is only 20% of that state. How does that work, right? That illustrates to you to socioeconomic imbalance, right? Which means that uh, the black community in America is poorly insured on health insurance, right? And also, uh, black people in America are the least likely to take life insurance policies, right? Never mind what the philosophical, like, you know, the, the emotional implications of it are. Get, if you can, engage yourself in understanding how life insurance policies work, right? You'd be paying, and don't get me wrong, a lot of people can't afford this, right? But if you are of the position, there are people in America, black people in America, who are in, who are earning salaries of seventy five to eighty thousand dollars a year, but they're still not opening a life insurance policy where they have to pay eighty five dollars a month, maybe even less, right? Eighty five dollars a month when you're earning eighty thousand dollars a year is nothing. Get a life insurance policy. Try and see if you can find cheaper healthcare insurance policies. That will protect your children. It's about protecting your children, by the way, protecting yourself about the fact that should you get your leg chopped off or should you get diabetes and should you lose a job, right? Or should you be diagnosed with a terminal illness that makes you unable to work? You have a policy that will protect you and your family, right? So we need to be well-versed in the literature of finance that covers people in times of hardship. Okay, so, okay, so you're saying because there, there's a, a, a form of deficit Yes, um, massively. That's one of the reasons why. Okay. You know, and, and, you, and the thing is, play with you, you, you can actually play in the same playing field that we're always saying is unbalanced. It is unbalanced, but you can still play the game uh, in, the same, in the same field, right? Uh, and I know for a fact I'm going to get people coming at me with a volley of like, uh, as I said to you, there was a guy who dismissed me under one of my videos saying that I sound like I'm overprivileged. <laughs> I reek yeah. of uh, private school education. So what I'm saying is I know I'm going to be dismissed as like, oh, this guy's living in a cloud. But no, the, at the end of the day, he, he has no idea how hard it is. Oh, trust me, I'm all too aware of how hard it is. I know dot for dot 
of how hard it is if I look at it through the lens of how England operates. But hardship is not the reason for us to disengage. You understand? Hardship, mm -hmm. is, hardship is not the reason why we should not be engaged in our own financial literacy. So, okay, so something like that, right? Is it a matter of, because we spoke about the information being there, leading someone to water, and it's up to them, or in horse or water, for instance, and it's up to the yeah. horse to drink it. Yeah. Um, and then we talk about appetite. You spoke about uh, like Kanye West and like some people have different interests, right? Yes. And they might be like right now, mo most people, I think we all at some degree um, consume entertainment way more than, um, you know, like educational material and stuff like Far that. Too much. Far too much. Of people do that. So it's like, so I think it's a thing that happens and everyone is like that. So when it comes on to doing maybe certain things, they're like, oh, it's better to do this instead. You know, this, I can just sit down and passively consume this thing versus being engaged, um, you know, in this context. So, so, can I, can so I just hold it? But how do you do it though? So what I'm asking is, do, is it a matter of just, having something centralized where people can get that type of info um, or because how would they get it? It's out there still. It's not like it's not out there, but people just don't care about it and aren't looking for it. Some people, not everyone, because yeah, there yeah. are people who, who are there, but for those people who this could benefit, how do you get this information to them and hopefully inspire them enough to act upon it? Okay. So you just, uh, you mentioned two things there. Uh, one was passive consumption and two was the word better. Right, you said, "Oh, it's better if I sit here uh, and just watch this, uh, and mm -hmm. it's better if I passively consume this." So, one, don't ever be in a position of passive consumption of anything. Now, in today's world, that is very, very hard because you've got Facebook, you've got Instagram, you've got TikTok, you've got uh, WeChat, you've got every single, uh, you, you've got YouTube, and so the, the Spotify. There are a million apps and gaming apps and so on and so forth. Right that keep you distracted. So a resilient mind is much harder to cultivate in today's society than it was in the past because there is so much more to distract you, right? But you cannot be of the mind that being economically empowered is secondary to you passively consuming Kanye West news. Like the, the idea of consuming entertainment is uh, as old as mankind, right? We all consume entertainment as much, but at a certain point, you have to be accountable for what you are consuming. You have to be accountable for what you are engaging. You are a manifestation of everything that you read and engage, right? No, it, indeed, but I think it still comes back to the, I think, who was it? I was listening to someone, I think it was two, maybe yesterday or the day before. I think it comes down to, the appetite i know it's like you know because i find myself sometimes talking to people about certain things and mm -hmm. someone might, it I, I feel like one someone might not be at that level um or that stage of their journey yet there was this yeah. thing i saw i wish i could pull it up about um it was about malcolm x and it was also about um what's her name wait wait wait, wait. you know what? i think i have it wait just literally like five seconds it's a screenshot um and i think this might be the case as well for a lot of people and not because someone is in a uh, a certain state presently, it does not mean that that's going to be the reality, right? Or this is going to be um, where they're going to be five years from now. Where is it? I want to find it because I, I don't think I can quote it properly. Um, wait, let's see if we can find it. I was showing my wife the other day. Someone might... Yeah, this is the thing. I'm so many things. I can't, I, okay, I can't find it, but I'm just going to take too much time. So it was talking about Malcolm X at a stage in, in his life. And what's the next? The lady, the lady, what's her name again? Oh my God, I can't remember. But they're saying if this, if Malcolm X died at age 20, he would have been. Um, oh, I, guess, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. You remember, right? So it was showing you like people at different stages in their lives can be one it, way, maybe it, five it, something years. about um, Maya Angelou was in that as well, right? Yeah, yeah she was. And at as one well. point, she had been a prostitute yeah. or something. Yes, yeah. yes. So they're saying if they died at this, at one level, at one stage of their journey. And that's the thing with people that people don't understand. And, and the thing is, I don't do this because I understand history. Someone might look at a person at one stage of their lives. And they judge the individual by that. And they believe that they're prophetic and they can predict the future, which no one can. And yes. they make a pronouncement on the indiv individual because maybe the guy right now is doing something um, untoward. Maybe the guy is like, you know, involved in some type of illicit activity. Yes. But yes. the truth of the matter is, 
this person can encounter something that can change their lives. And then five years from now, you won't even be able to recognize the person. So I understand that sometimes um, it's just that someone is not there yet. Yes, yes, um, right. and, and and humans should should exercise wisdom and understanding that when you see an individual, you because you're not God, you can never predict. The, you, none of us can. That's so right. because if people could, they would try to be a friend of a person when the person is not yet at a certain level. Because that's, that's right, the yes. best thing to get in. Yes, one, yes. Everybody wants your attention, and you now you can't get in because now everyone is suspicious. You're like, okay, you're more guarded. Um, so right. the time is before the person reaches that level. But a lot of people judge people too harshly and believe that where someone is presently will be the, the place that they will remain forever. Yes, yes. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a big problem with people. Yeah. But yeah. what I'm trying to say is that um, in terms of imparting information and even what we're talking about right now, and even, I find myself doing it sometimes where I'm talking to someone and trying to share something and the person is just not for it in that moment in time. And I know that it works. And you're just like, man, like I'm just wasting my time. But I, I believe as well, like my brother told me um, sometimes, he's like, look, um, you know, you had this, you know, like, for instance, you're at one stage and then the, you, you were at, because he's my brother. So he knows, you know, my, my coming up, growing up. He's like, well, you know, it took you a time before you did this or before yes. this, or whatever. So some people, is just, they're just not where they need to be yet. And I yeah. think sometimes when we, we, we share things, it's not that they don't really care. But I, what I'm trying to say is that we should bear this in mind, even myself, that when we're imparting stuff, someone just might not be at the level to implement it yet. Um, so here's a solution. Oh so, Yeah. So they might be on their way, but yes. the information won't register just yet. Give them five more years. I might say, oh, Q said this. And then the implementation begins then. So here's a solution. Here's a solution, right? Um, I've learned a lot from uh, a lot of... Uh, platform similar to SSRN, right? SSRN mm -hmm. is a very recent encounter for me, but previously I would engage other things. Like for example, uh, essentially the, the broad term for what I'm about to describe is, is known as, in tech, it's known as open source platforms. Understood. Right? Open source. So you were saying is if somebody is not quite yet at the stage where they, they can utilize your knowledge and utilize your experience, how can you ensure that at some point or other, they can still have access to it? And it comes back to the simple word, open source. Create open sources for people to be able to engage and extract the necessary information that they need. So the most, the, the easiest uh, one to know, uh, to exemplify is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an open source platform. SSRN is an open source platform, right? Uh, and through the madness of things like 4chan, and I'm sorry to use that example, so many people are going to hate it, but 4chan is an open source platform for certain types of information, and it takes forever to get through the right stuff, right? But the key thing is, if you want people to access a level of, certain level of wisdom, a certain level of information, mm -hmm. create an open source platform that they can later on. If you're trying to talk to a 19 year old today and say, listen, you need to actually understand about life insurance policies, but he's a bit like, dude, I'm going to a club, I want to party, right? Yeah. Then what you do is instead of being angry and sort of say, you know what, you refuse to listen to me, so I'm gonna keep this information, and throw it into a drawer. What you do instead is you leave it in an open source, right? Leave it on an open source so that he can access it later, which is why so many people from uh like for example how many people are aware that mit about seven years ago mit massachusetts institute of, uh, institute of technology gave complete free and open this is actually 10 years ago sorry complete free open access to all their courses dating up to 2007 i think how many people know that so essentially you could go on the MIT website and go into the astrophysics department and access everything they've ever taught about astrophysics up until 2008 or 2010, I think, right? And you can read anything you want about that. And if you consistently read it and take up all the assignments, all the courses, all the material, three years from now, you would, four years from now, you would have a degree in astrophysics, the equivalent of. Maybe you may not be accredited, the same way as somebody who has officially gone to MIT. But the thing is, you have just read the same information as a guy who's working at NASA who studied at MIT throughout the 90s.
You've now got the same information over the next four years. So you have to cultivate a patience. So create open source platforms and let people read everything they possibly can, right? Um, one, one channel that I know a lot of people are, are aware of, one YouTube channel that I know a lot of black people are aware of, right, is Vlad, Vlad TV, mm -hmm. right? Are you familiar with Vlad TV? Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you familiar yeah. with Vlad Stocks? No. Right? You could take 1,000 black, uh, not just black, but we could take 1,000 kids, right, from an urban environment, like a city environment, like London or New York or whatever, and you ask them, do you guys know Vlad? Yeah, yeah, oh, I know Vlad. I've watched the, the, the Papoose interview. I've watched the, the Pusha T interview. I've watched the, this and that interview. They'll tell you, all the, out of those 1,000 kids, they will all tell you that they've definitely watched Vlad TV for all the interviews he does with practice. But I'm willing to bet any money that out of that 1,000, only five are aware of Vlad stocks. Vlad Stocks is essentially the guy who, st who operates Vlad, uh, Vlad TV, Vlad himself, right? Literally launched a platform called Vlad Stocks to openly, and Vlad is a, is a white dude of Russian descent, by the way. Right? Um, he, he opened a, a channel called uh, Vlad Stocks, which he said by his own words, I did this to be able to give access to the people who view my channel. And I think that was just his sideways way of saying most black people basically. Right, he's saying I th I started Vlad Stocks to be able to allow the people who engage my channel to understand how the stock market works and to realize that it is not the magic trick that they think it is. Right, mm -hmm. that's an open source. That is an open source. So right now, a kid in Yonkers or a kid in Brooklyn or a kid in Kinshasa, right, can access Vlad Stocks, look at the stock market, and say, "Crap, I'm in Kinshasa. I've got no money." Right. But if he was to work for a year and manage to save up, let's say, 250 US dollars, he can put 250 US dollars into the stock market, right, and leave it for the next 10 years. In 10 years' time, maybe it builds up to $1,800. So we're not going to name a crazy number, but let's just say uh, he put $250 and now it's $1,800. The point is $250 worth of savings sat in a stock market. He didn't have to do anything. And it grew to $1,800, right? Because he accessed an open source platform like Vlad Stocks. So go ahead and that's what we need to do. We need to start accessing. A lot of the time we behave in this conspiratorial behavior where we say, uh, well, a lot of the information about black history on Wikipedia is written by such and such people. And how do we know it's true? You know, uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the stuff that's out there is not redesigned for me. So how do I know it's going to work for me? Well, you don't up until you engage it. Right. Under, understood. Um, I'm that's, not, the only, that's the only way, the only place the, 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 the playing field can be level, can yeah, be leveled that, out. The thing is, that I understand what you're saying, like having open source and even something like that, that about Vlad, Vlad stocks that I never yeah. know about. It's yeah. like it's there, right. So it's, it's, it's like it's there for people who want to go and get it. Yes. Um, but the thing is, it's like the people who are of your mind. Yeah. And people who are, you know, naturally inquisitive, people who um, are always seeking to, uh, who are ambitious and seeking to yeah. better themselves in their position and their and that of their posterity. You have people like that, right? Who are doing mm -hmm. things like that. Um, the I think the concern even within the black community because you do have quite a few successful people, uh, yes. people in academia, people in business, people in you know uh, STEM, uh, people in all these things. But I think it's the most vulnerable that the concern is about people who like the guys that you say who would just be into maybe just listening to a certain type of music or don't care about anything else um mm. like, okay this is all i'm about like entertainment that's it i think for instance like myself um i've done stuff like in jamaica for instance where um, i grew up in an inner city community and mm. usually there's a way of mind for people generally they're not everyone um some people come from from really impoverished backgrounds right yeah. And I know it's the same thing right across the world. So if you're in any country, if you're from the inner city community, there's a certain way of life that you're used to. And you usually have maybe an outlier, as you said, from even like what uh, Malcolm um, Gladwell spoke about yeah. and other people as well, um, that might just excel, right? For whatever reason, it might be the upbringing of, upbringing of the parents. It might be um, access and exposure. And that person, you know, leaves the hood, so to speak, and they made something of themselves. And then other people um, get caught up in the cycle. Yes. And you know, they just followed what their parents did. Maybe um, the guys on the block, whatever, they just followed suit for whatever reason. I think those people are the most vulnerable. And those are the people who, 
might not necessarily find the information that's out there, right? Because I've engaged some of them as well. Um, I'm from that community. I grew up there. I'm really connected to that type of lifestyle, like deeply. So I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was I, there was a thing I did in Jamaica where we did like a, a sort of like speaking thing where we had some people from these communities. We did it for free that came in. And then we, you know, we shared some information. Um, we try to do, do it like, you know, connect with the people that you know. Yeah. And then we share some information and some people did take it on and, you know, went out, got jobs and stuff. And they're telling me, oh, yeah, I got a job now, which was like, I felt so good that you yeah. know, people that never yes, had yes. jobs actually. <laughs> but Brilliant. it was a really amazing feeling. But I feel like people like those and some of them, you can't reach them because you might show them the way you might say, or maybe not the way, because there's like a lot of different ways. So yes, yeah, many ways it's going to cut. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but if you're saying like, you might see a person, you're saying you could see maybe a way that they could remove themselves from this position and you understand some of the challenges, maybe all of it, because you yourself have gone through it um, and you came to a crossroads maybe where you needed to make a decision and you chose one, another path versus another, this path. How can some of them, like some of the excuses I've heard, and I don't want to use the word excuse because I understand some of these way of life is really, really bad. Mm. Um, it's crazy. And the influence um, of the people around you is very, is, this peer pressure thing is so powerful, man. And sometimes some of them would say to me, look, this is the only way out, yo. Like, yeah. it's just like, there's like nothing else. You can't say anything. You can't say, how about, trying this or oh i know this works why don't you try this and you're trying to to get them to, to show them some show them some light um and it's like look first of all one they might say yo i'm not smart enough to do that yeah now, you know, school or whatever the school or this or that is for those type of people you know i'm not cut out for that type of thing um you know like oh they give you all these excuses I, and i think those are the people who need help the most i really believe that because someone else who might be watching right now who whether they went to university or not, may have a business, they might have gone to university, uh, they may, might be a PhD, they might be all these things. So they understand they're on, at a different level in terms of access, right? Yeah. But I think that when it comes down to the, to the collective, it is the most vulnerable that yeah. need the most help. And those are the ones who won't, for some reason, whatever it is, whatever influence it is, won't seek the information that we're talking about. So yeah. even if you know a book that's waiting for you, that will that will present you with the answers that you seek, like the book has it. There might yes. be a book that can answer the questions that you have right now, but you have no appetite for reading that book. How? Yeah. My, my question is, I know it's, as we said, we spoke about, you know, going to the water yes. and you know, it's up to them. But how can we make something like that attractive for people like that? Um, how can we really, um, you know, get them interested in the things that we know can take them to a higher level yeah. despite so, how they feel about themselves? I think that's where it's at. Because someone else who's in business already, they, they feel like they're good. They're like, listen, y'all can't teach me nothing. I'm good. Um, other people who, you know, feel like they're at a certain level, they understand certain things. So I think they're okay. They can find the information on their own. But those yeah. are the most vulnerable. How well, do we reach those people? So first and foremost, if you want to connect with such an audience, right, uh, and that, that bracket of the community, because in the same way as you say, you come from that, um, I myself, like that's why I said in the beginning that the neighborhood I came from in Zimbabwe is rather infamous, but we grew up there, it was normal to us, right? Uh, so okay. I, I'm all too aware, I mean, the stories that I can uh, dish out about my, my neighbors, the kids I grew up with, you know, uh, just uh, stories that you only hear about in, documentaries about favelas you know that those are the kind of stories that uh have have kind of materialized from the neighborhood i came from same thing with even even in london the school like i said to you, the school that i went to um the stories that have come out of there with uh, the kids that i went to school with yeah just like i said stuff of uh, documentaries and films right so the thing is um you're talking about how do you engage such an audience especially specifically talking about uh the black community right mm -hmm. is that First and foremost, there, there, is, uh, there is this one quote I once came across, right? Uh, where this guy, uh, he was a psychologist, a sociologist, and he said, he observed, uh, he was always uh, observing within, uh, I don't know what his, his particular field of expertise was, but it obviously had a lot to do with different ethnicities and observing them in Western society. And he said that in all his uh, work, he found that black people had the highest level of self-esteem that he had observed but the lowest levels of group esteem, right? Okay. So when you talk about the difficulty of engaging such an audience, 
the fact that the majority are the vulnerable ones, right? It's about, first of all, acknowledging and observing that low collective esteem. Because the, the irony of it all is that when I come across Chinese people here or Indian people or Malay people and they talk to me, man, there's always this awe that they have of black people because what they see in entertainment is like oh my god they're so confident they're so like self-assured and they're really cool and blah 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 and that sort of thing right so what they see is this group of people who just are very out there and like you know say it as it is and we we you know um but then and it's interesting it's always the younger guys the younger guys are always fascinated by the coolness and they're yeah you guys are so cool and so confident whatever and what's interesting is that I've had conversations with people at every level, right? So the yeah. guys at the younger level who are in their 20s are just fascinated by me because they're like, oh, yeah, you're part of that group of cool people that we see on YouTube all the time making awesome videos, right? And you're confident, yada, yada, you dress cool, etc. And then, but as you get older and you start engaging the older audience, they always ask me a similar line of questions, right? Which is, why are there so many, they all say to me, why is there so much uh, economic disparity between the black communities in, of the West and other communities, right? Mm -hmm. And I do think it comes from that collective, uh, like that low group esteem, where amongst, in and amongst ourselves, we remember in the, in the interview that I did with you, right? Mm -hmm. I was saying, why are we asking things from the outside that we're not affording internally within the community? So there has to be an open level of trust and mutual confidence in each other, that if I open, an African goods shop, right? I need to be patronized by people who come from there, rather than you saying that, oh, you know, you're you're just uh, profiteering for me. You're 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 taking your your margins are too high, and, and so on and so forth. And I've seen that in London, by the way. I've seen people of our color, of our persuasion, refusing to go to black-owned businesses selling goods that are in the same shop as non-black-owned shops. And I'm saying, why? Like, oh, well, no, that, that, that black guy is going to charge me too much. His margins are too crazy. I'm like, but then how do you know that? At the end of the day, you're talking about a, 10, a 10p difference. Yeah, but why should I pay 10p more to him when I can get it? You know, and there's that very, that, that very much, a lot of people, if, if there are people from London watching this, they will know what I'm talking about, right? They will know what I'm talking about. So first of all, you have to address, maybe acknowledge the low group esteem and make kids understand that, the low group esteem that they feel is something that they were not even aware of. It is something that is so deeply subconscious that they were not even aware that they were discriminating against each other because they look like each other. And Nipsey Hussle spent it best. He said that when, when gang shootouts happen, right, uh, somebody shoots up your neighborhood and you go back and shoot the other side. This is in LA. He was like, you don't go out. You're so highly charged emotionally, right, that you're almost going to pull the trigger at anyone except he's like, we know that we see a Hispanic guy walking past, like, nah, I'm going to ignore him. We see a white guy walking past, like, nah, I'm going to ignore him. And then he said, you see a guy who looks like you. He walks like you. He's got your swag. He's got your demeanor on the street. He said, and you tell yourself, even though I didn't see the shooter, we're going to shoot this guy because he looks like you. So there's this disturbing, deeply embedded, right, self-deprecation which manifests itself in so many corrosive ways, right? And that's just one small component, by the way, of our community, because we've achieved so many more amazing things. I'm just simply trying to address the majority that you were talking about, the fact yeah. that there's a majority out there who are so difficult to get. So the thing is, you, as somebody who is enlightened, need to be aware of the fact that these kids, while they've got all this bravado in the classroom and stuff like that, right, they are really unaware of the fact that they're just suffering from a manifestation of low, cell, low group esteem. Right. So you address that to start with. But also the second thing to address and to implement rather is the 80-20 rule. Right. Implement the 80-20 rule. If you have 20 percent of any population that is adequately enlightened, mm -hmm. then the remaining 80 percent are going to be illuminated enough to also subdivide within that 80 percent to sort of say half of that 80 percent are going to be inspired by that illuminated enlightened 20% that they are going to emulate. And then by virtue of doing that, the remaining half of that, of that first 80% end up being indirect beneficiaries, right? Mm -hmm. Of the behavior of that first half of the 80%. But the thing is, you have to get to a point where that first 20% is so enlightened and so influential, by the way, right? They have to be very, very influential, Indeed. right? 
so that they can illuminate the remaining 80%. That's how you implement that process. That's the first step of that process, right? Because essentially everything is viral. All behavior is viral. Good behavior is viral. Of course, history would show you that bad behavior is much more viral than good behavior. That much is acknowledged. That applies to any race, any ethnicity, any point in history. Bad behavior is much more viral than good. Right. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. But it's just the way it is, right? So what I'm saying is you apply the 80-20 rule. You 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 go to the school where, as you say, you see these kids who are just unengaged, unbothered, right? But you isolate if you've got if you've got 10 kids in a classroom, right? Isolate the two who are the brightest minds and have got leadership skills. Very, very bright, they've got leadership skills, right? So that they can influence, they can influence four other people. So take two kids and get them to influence four other people so that between the two of them, one of them leads two, the other one leads two. So now you've got two triumvirates, right? And that's six people already. You've already got 60% of the group locked down and then you only have 40% remaining. And then they will eventually become overwhelmed by the positive majority that they will look up and say, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that this was going on around us. All right, let's fall in line. So 80-20 rule, illuminate the 20% such that they can influence the next four, the next 40%, right? So that the remaining 40% are now overwhelmed by a positive 60% majority. And you know what? Um, there's one thing, because there's this, there's this thing, I'm going to do it regardless um, that I want to do as well in terms of like that, um, what you're talking about is because I understand, right? Uh, mm. This this group, I think, are the most important um, because everyone else, you know, some people are comfortable or content with where they are yeah. and um, they have all they need, all they need to, you know, move on. Oh, yeah. um, but of course, they still need sometimes, you know, different things. Um, but I feel like if we can find the enlightened, right? So yeah. if we can find people like that and then dispatch those people, but it depends on the individual, right? Because it depends, yes. the person has to have the heart for it because not everyone has the heart for it. Um, because you have a, you can have conversations with people who they don't care about anything else. They're just like, listen, not my business, whatever. So as you said, we find the people who are enlightened one and who also want to reach out to these people and then we connect them and then so the person who is you know of that that um uh, predisposition uh you, you know like put them out there if they're willing to be mentors etc and then they can draw to them um the people who some of the most vulnerable people and then yeah. start that way and then we can maybe do that type of thing um, and by the way don't forget don't leave yourself out of this discussion because you are part of that <laughs> no, no, no. Well, this, yeah i've been doing things like you know from from time but it's the but by doing i'll probably let you finish because maybe i i'm assuming that you were saying something else um but after this you can you can complete that um like so these people would do it and then, and the thing is, we by doing so, we're going to contend with media still, because as you said earlier, and I know this to be true, anything you consume, anything you read or you watch um, consistently or listen to consistently will get into your mind. It's just the way it is. It will change the makeup of your mind. The thoughts yeah. that enter your head or habitually just like, just move yeah. around in your head will yeah. be influenced largely by what you consume. That is without question. Yep. So if someone is doing something like that, they have to contend with that, right? So you have to make sure that sure that these people are in a in an environment where they're getting this stimulation um, as often as possible, um, and maybe eventually to tear them away. To, you know what? Even that process could be a process where we're cultivating this type of appetite. We're changing the appetite of the individual um, yep. by introducing them to something else, and then maybe they won't have um uh this sort of like draw to the the type of content or information that will harm them as much as the one that will edify them and take them to another level so i think that process of connecting mentor with mentee uh someone who's willing who is at in a certain position yeah. um by connecting them together then what you could do is um you'll help that process right because i remember yeah. even myself i did have like um a mentor at one point as well and for me with certain things i think the difference might have been exposure or access to certain yeah. things. I was lucky enough to come in contact with certain things that may have um, helped me out a bit um, um, when I was younger. Um, so there's all the all these things. So maybe connecting people with someone like that, um, it will help. So the process of 
seeing um, someone doing something, whatever it is, and uh, maybe something that you want to do. Um, yeah. And then also, you know, helping the person to try to tear them away from the destructive um, type of thing that they consume. And eventually maybe that that's one way, at least it's something that's practical that can be done. I'm going yes. for it. I know these people need it because someone who is already going to school, if they want to go to school or someone who wants to do business, if they want to do business, um, yes. someone who wants to pursue whatever it is and they're already doing that, they're fine for the most part. You know, they're at least on a path that's leading them outside yes, uh, exactly. of darkness, so to speak. But the people are still trapped there. Yeah. These are the people that we're concerned about. Um, these are the people that are engaged maybe in the most um, illicit activities because, of course, we know that poverty breeds a lot of stuff. Um, yes, like, yeah, yeah. So yeah. definitely that group has to be the target group because if we can lift that group up, yeah. then I think most things will change because people look at someone else, even black people and say, Oh, this person is doing that. They're not appreciative of that. Like they talk against other impoverished black people who are doing certain things that they believe is bringing the community down. So yeah. I think all efforts, maybe at least 90%, at least 80% should be geared toward that group. Well, are- geared, toward, geared towards that group by the active group, ensuring that it is in itself doing more to better itself. So essentially we and you and what you're doing have to become the open source that I was referring to. Mm -hmm. You have to become the open source that can exemplify to the group what to do and how to do it. That's why I keep going back to saying open sources. We have to open up information access and dissemination in our communities is not very, very good. So we have to open up, right? Create open sources and get rid of the paranoia that if we uh, leave ourselves open, uh, we're going to get, well, and maybe we are, maybe to an extent, we are going to be exposing ourselves to some extent, right? Um, and you could do it twofold. You could do open sources, but you could also do very, very active non-open sources, whatever it is, right? One way or another, the people leading the charge, the people who are going to take on the task of being mentors, being uh, take on the task of being the leaders, right? They have to exemplify it first and foremost before worrying about uh, the, 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 those that are left behind, right? So mm -hmm. set the example. Set the example and make sure that once you've set the example, you don't stand on an ivory tower and say, well, I got up here and I did it. Why can't you? No, no, no. The idea is once you've set the example, make sure you say the door is open, by the way, right? I got up this far and I'm going to help you. I'm going to throw you down a rope and it could to pull you up, right? As, as, as was once said, if you are fortunate enough to make it to the top, it is your responsibility to send the elevator down, Yeah. right? So okay. what I'm saying is, I'm going to emphasize this, open sources are exactly what create uh, or are exactly what give people uh, empowerment. They're exactly what empower people to have knowledge. Knowledge is power, right? Indeed. So start engaging Vlad Stocks, start engaging SSRN, start engaging the MIT website and look at what, what free courses they have on there. Because in so doing, you will be reading the same information as the people that you see being interviewed on Bloomberg, on CNN, the same people that you see being interviewed on financial uh, journals, the same people that you see being interviewed in GQ and so on, and, and The Economist, right? If you read those things, right, you will be, the, the, as I say, it, it may seem like some kind of like uh, easy fix, but it really and truly isn't magical. It's not, it's not that difficult, right? Pick up the same information that those guys went to, the same institutions. You, like what you can access today, the level of knowledge that you can access today about how to open a, a stock trading account with $100 was not available just 10 years ago. It wasn't. It wasn't available 10 years ago. And no, you don't have to pay for any of those advertised courses on YouTube that say, well, with my special information, I, you can pay me $2,500 and over three months you can pay, you, you will learn how to be, uh, the, you know, uh, trade a million dollars. No, you don't have to do that. You simply have to commit and dedicate yourself to three to four months of reading two hours every night, right? And this is another, uh, another theory. Like uh, one of the things is that we don't, we don't know enough about theories that are out there that are being implemented in corporate industries uh, or by someone. Like, for example, one of the most effective theories that was ever written was something called marginal gains, right? In fact, there's two. There's two that I, I, I try to abide by. Don't quite know how successful I am, but 
Two, it's, one is called marginal gains. Everybody has to read up on the theories about marginal gains. That's what creates success. Everybody, too, too often in our communities, like I said, because of how hard it is to get out of a, of a certain circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. We become exhausted and frustrated that we just don't believe it when somebody says to you, it's a lot simpler than you think. We don't believe it. But you have to read up on theories about marginal gains. It's extraordinary stuff, right? And the second one, which is very little known, very, very little known, right, is one called superb execution, right? Read up on superb execution. Just go on Google, type it in, superb execution, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you read up on. And the third one, I've just added a third one, right? Um, is uh, a, by a former U.S. Navy SEAL called Jocko Willink. And this is the thing. Wait, the example that I'm are using. You, are you going to extreme execution? Uh, no, no, it's called um, uh, Extreme Accountability. Okay, okay, okay. Extreme Accountability by Jocko Willink, right? When you say so Supreme you, Execution, are you talking about a book you, you wrote that's called Extreme Execution as well? No, is, no, no, no. So super, superb execution is a very old theory. It comes from India, okay. I think, actually. Okay, it's a okay. mathematical superb execution has got to do has got a lot to do with mathematics. I think okay. it comes from India, right? Uh, and then, like I said, you got marginal gains, which is which was written, I think, by a, a, a psychologist, a, a woman. Uh, she wrote it a few years ago. And athletes use it a lot. Athletes okay. use the theory of marginal gains a lot, right? But, uh, and and then, then is it also is that something? Uh, what's her name? Angela Duckworth, and she spoke about grit and deliberate practice. So deliberate practice. I think that's the it? one. So it's okay. So it's okay. So it's similar to that. Okay. I okay. think. I think it's how. Yeah. It's, I don't. When, know. You, when you said at least, it sounds like like deliberate practice. Um, it, it seems like it's the same. Yes. Marginal uh, gain, deliberate practice. I feel like it's the same thing. They implement that type of thing to get this incremental gain, pretty much, to better themselves and move forward, like a little at, at a time. Something to that effect. If I'm, let me know if I'm wrong or am I, I'm right. I don't know. Is that so what's, the theory? what's the theory? It's by so the marginal gains. The marginal gains theory is concerned with small incremental improvements in mm -hmm. any yeah. process, which yeah. when and which when added together makes a significant improvement over time. Yeah, so that so deliberate practice brings about marginal gains. So there you go. Yeah. That's okay. right. So so read up on marginal gains, right? Read up on superb execution, mm -hmm. and then read up on extreme accountability. Those three things, like I said, you, you can actually you can easily focus on those three things for the next year alone, just the next 12 months. Read up everything you can about those, just those three things. And you will find that those three things will affect the way you eat, they will affect the way you read. They will affect the way you think. They will affect the way you dress. They will affect the way you talk. Just those three things. Superb yeah. execution. Mm -hmm. Marginal gains. Ex extreme accountability. Right? And the most significant thing about those three sources, right, is the fact that they don't necessarily come from just black people. You understand? So we, you shouldn't be so insular. You have to open your mind to any positive theory out there and bring indeed. it back in and see how you can apply it. And I'll tell you something indeed, indeed. slightly unsavory about how I approach this thing of learning from anyone, right? There was a series of about 15 videos that I watched of a former uh, prisoner, mm -hmm. right? I, fi I, fi I just found him incredibly fascinating, right? He, he was in the, uh, in the American county jail system, or not even county, I don't know, federal prison. Mm -hmm. And hardcore federal prison, the hardest angle of federal prison that you could actually really, and you can see this guy is doing his videos, just the way he looks, he looks, he looks scary. I, I do not <laughs> want to come across a guy like that on the street. I just don't, right? I'm not afraid of much, but <laughs> this is a guy who's seen and done things, unsavory things, right? But I listened to about 15 of his videos and he is fascinating, not because of who he is aesthetically, but because of his mindset and the way he, he designed, you just said deliberate practice, right? Yeah. Because of the way he deliberately practiced and designed his mind while he was in prison. And I found this incredible. It's fascinating, right? So I'm listening, and I, I've literally written bodies of notes on what this guy has said about the idea of being very, like, discipline for him was extraordinarily important, right? Mm -hmm. Discipline, discipline, discipline. He was like, I was the first guy. I would wake up 3.30 a.m., right? I would do 100 burpees. Sit down for a bit, 4.30 a.m., go and shower, 
do 100 burpees after that, right? And he was like, I was like a machine. And essentially, he kind of ended up, even in the prison system, being a bit of a commander, right? He was a bit of a commander. He was a bit of a badass. and frightening. And he was a really, really tough group. And he rose the ranks all the way up to the top. But the way he spoke about how he did it, right? If you remove the fact that he's a former prisoner, mm -hmm. right? You will realize that this was a guy who was actually practicing superb execution, extreme accountability, right? And the idea of marginal gains through the same processes being repeated over and over and over and over and over, right? Now, this is the last part about that guy that I'm going to reveal, which is very interesting. And this guy, right, was formerly a neo-Nazi. Okay. No, I understand. Like, like I, I, I mean? I, 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 it's just that... You, Knowledge it's, and learning can, can, can be achieved and acquired no, yeah, from no. anywhere. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my approach as well. That's my approach as well. So for yeah. me, I don't mind. Like, I listen to anyone because I feel like, yeah, that's me. I listen. I can listen to a homeless person. Yeah. And the person's, look, I'm that person. You'll hear me. I'll, you know, I talk a lot, but I do listen a lot as well. And I take stuff in and I listen to anyone. So just like you're saying, I will watch whatever videos. I'll read whatever book. Yeah. I listen to anyone. It doesn't matter to me because I can filter out. I take what I want. Yeah. I, I Toss out what you I leave out the rest exactly yeah yeah so be an eternal student so I'm not that type of person ever and I hope I'll never become that person who tell people to shut up I don't want to hear I listen to you I might disagree yeah take it in and then I'll see what I can do with it if something can be done there's always something to learn right there's one thing that you said that I think oh for instance okay we're talking about two different like cohorts right one yeah. is the most vulnerable yeah. which I think needs the most help and yeah. then for those people who just uh who want better but they find that they habitually do things that are self-destructive or destructive. Yes. We, we spoke about discipline and even Jocko um, spoke about, um, he said that discipline, self-discipline is freedom, which I yes. believe to be true. Uh, when you said the guy did burpees, I'm like, okay, that guy, if you're doing burpees, you know what it's like, right? So oh. anyone that does burpees consistently, it will show you who you are. Trust me. And I've been working out twice a day, every day. You uh, better do the the burpees. I tell them about the burpees. I still do my 100 plus a day. You got to do I, it. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I'm doing crazy stuff. I'm, I'm doing half a marathon in a few hours. I'll be okay. running half a marathon in a few okay. hours. So. Okay, so, okay, so you're, you're doing it. Cool. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but one thing is, um, when it comes on to people, right, and what you're talking about, deliberate practice, and all these things, extreme execution, extreme um, accountability, all these things, it's like, sometimes we are our greatest enemies because we know yes. what we do. All right. And for some reason, we don't do it. So what I think is important or it is very simple, but it works to get to that level that you're talking about. Just say you're talking about reading um, a certain amount each night or whatever is forcing yourself. Right. Having enough self-discipline in that moment for the period of time, which is necessary. Um, I was reading this book called One Thing recently. And usually people say it takes 30 days to like yeah. change a, um, a habit. It's, right. It's, it's something to become a habit. Yes. Yeah. I think 30 days for me works, but the book was talking about that the actual day, um, days that's required is 66. Okay. okay, so let's let's say okay, 66 days or whatever. If someone can um have or apply self-discipline for 66 days, 30 to 66 days. I say 30 because that's how I changed my body. Um, and that's how I became addicted to running and all that stuff. I did that like for 30 days, and by that time, I never wanted to stop. It was easy for me in terms yeah. of myself up to go out there i never had to fight myself to like oh yeah. man i gotta go out oh my god i did it so much that now i'm like oh snap okay i can't wait you're already getting ready you're like oh snap it's time to run um yes so like, it's like people don't understand how i can run 7k three times a week plus right? 10K at the end of the week right? Yeah. right so it's like even reading for people who want to do something different right and they understand all these things already and it's just them standing in their own way it's all about forcing yourself to do that thing when you don't want to do it and do that long enough until it becomes, as I say, switch to autopilot mode. So it's yeah. like it's there. So once the time comes, if you're reading time, for instance, it's 10 p.m., I'm not sure how you do it. It's like you've done it so much that once 10 o'clock comes or close to it, you feel like you're reaching for a book. That's you're right. You feel already, it. But you yeah, feel but you have the to. body and the mind is now geared. Yes. Yeah. Right? That's the thing. So Automation, that's what, basically. Yeah. So that's, I think that's, I think everyone can do that. Automate good, good habits. Yeah. yeah. Replace the bad habits with good ones by forcing yourself. And initially, it's going to be so hard, man. So hard as well, so which hard. is why initially focus on the it. smallest things. Changing, to focus on changing the smallest things. Like, for yeah. example, it could be one thing you could do is ensuring that uh, you change the habit of how you, for example, wear your shoes, right? You tell yourself that every single week yeah. on a Thursday and a Sunday, you're going to wash your trainers, your sneakers. That's it. That takes, that takes a five to seven minutes. 
I make my daughter wash her shoes every week. She's not that dirty. Like, <laughs> but we wash. We and in the mornings we work out together. By the way, she works out with me for. I'll do a thirty-five minute workout. Right, she's working out with me for about seven to ten minutes. Her her incentive is to uh, get chocolate milk. <laughs> but the thing is, I if, even it's it's we've been doing it so much, right? That on the mornings when I have it, like, let's say in the last thirty days, I've missed out maybe three or four mornings of not working out. Right? Mm -hmm. She comes up to me because why are you not working out? She'll say that to me straight. She's like, why are you not working out? Because for her, it has become habit. She has become, she has started to associate it with something positive that she sees as positive, right? Yeah. So she sees me running up and down and so on and so forth. So you have to automate good behavior in such a way that, in fact, this is about the idea of impacting other people. Automate a good behavior within yourself in such a way that even somebody who is not you is now expecting you to do it, i.e., in this case, my daughter. She now even expects me to do that because she's a bit like, hey, dude, What's happening? What's up with the fitness today? Right? Because her she's now automated and thinking that no, this is part of Baba's routine, right? In mm -hmm. the morning, he does it every day. So if he doesn't do it, something must have happened. So she yeah. inquires, you know? Yeah. Uh and th that's just how it is. If if I'm not in my gym clothes, she's definitely questioning it. It's like, oh, are you going to work? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. So so why are you yeah. not in your gym clothes? So you have to do something of such habit that even the people who who are not supportive, right? Or people who are indifferent. To you just say changing your habit right changing your food for example if you say if you eat rice every day cut it down to say i'm going to eat rice three times a week right so i'm going to do it three times a week right to the point where everyone even at home saying oh what are you doing are you reading all this fancy nonsense online about your, your rice just eat rice and then you if you refuse and you stick to it mm -hmm. after a certain amount of time if they see if they see you eating rice on the days that they don't, they don't expect you they'll say oh i thought you were not eating rice so by that point you realize that not not only is it automated in you it has now become automated in other people. And slowly, but most certainly surely, even they will start to sort of say, okay, let me see what happens if I try the same thing. Yeah. Right. It, so it, that's it, why I said you have to illuminate the 20% the, the, the have to illuminate themselves so much that they bring on an extra 40% along with them, meaning that the remaining 40% are too overwhelmed to ignore what's going on. But also, you have to remember, you're never going to rescue everybody. That is not your task, it's not your job. In human history, it is proven yeah, that no matter yeah. how great a family is, and no matter how great a certain group is, right, there will always be certain, you know. Yeah, you, you can't you can't force, right? But I think um, I bad think, apples or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I feel like a lot of effort needs to be diverted um, toward um, the most vulnerable groups. But when most of the things that you were talking about earlier, when it comes down to implementation or implementing yes. these things for change, um, I think the people who are in a position to do those things. Um, or who at least have the appetite for it, but might be struggling in terms of actually doing the work. Because most yes. people, look, as you said, we're in the age of uh, information. We're in the yes. age of information. We are, so we are in, a, in, a, in a, a ridiculous revolution. And, and the problem with that is most people consume so much, but they fail to execute. And the thing is usually it's like the same habit. Like we just want to do something that's more passive. We just want to do something that doesn't require much effort. Usually it's like we're drawn to that, but anything that requires effort where like man i don't want to do that but the things yeah. that requires effort will give it the results so I'll, what i was saying was just that to implement all these things like the reading um, all the things that you spoke about uh someone might not be into reading about finances or whatever and because it's like it's boring to them or whatever but even though it's boring to some people forcing yourself to do what yeah. you don't want to do all you got to do is outlast the struggle long enough to where as you said it has become automated and then you're then you're cool you're good um yep, so that's exactly. the goal the goal is for those who want to do something different but you find yourself starting stopping all you got to do is go after it if you know it's going to benefit you and just go through the hard time and just suck it up you know it's like a medicine yep. or something that you don't like eating for whatever period you got to take it just do it long enough because there is there will be a moment or a point where you will find yourself being drawn to it versus being repelled right right yeah. now you're you don't want to go and, and engage in this activity because it's just unsavory you don't like it but if you yes. force yourself to do it eventually like myself for instance and i keep talking about this is very simple but it just i'm just talking about habits you yeah. can use the thing the principle of building good habits you can use it for anything in your life it's, it yes. doesn't have to be whatever any anything you force yourself to do it long enough like me eating certain things and now i don't even have the cravings for some of the things that people could can't resist most people can't resist right now i could look yes. at it and i don't even desire it because i built up that muscle of resistance 
and now I'm being drawn toward more healthier options. And yep. the good thing about that is it's beneficial. It's the same thing. Reading is the same thing. Just like you're saying, I, I went through a period at one point where whenever I had the the, the desire to, to watch a movie, because I like movies or watch, uh, consume some form of entertainment, I replaced that, right, with something educational. So it's the yeah. same exact principle. When the desire came, because it comes, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to watch a movie right now. That yeah. one hour, 30 minutes, I'm going to invest that in something else. And as you said, the process of doing that will change your mind. It will change so yes. much about you. And whenever I'm not in that zone, you can yeah. see it. I can, you can see it. And you start to feel sluggish. So the, the other <laughs> way to do it is this, right? Is that um, if you really find it so hard to remove yourself, let's say, for example, from watching that movie that you watch every Friday, then tell okay. yourself this. Initially, like I was saying, that the, way, the best way to convince somebody that this, these things are positive, but then they see them as punishment, it's really slow, it's, it's really painful or whatever. Tell yourself, okay, if I watch two hours of a film, I'm going to, quote, punish myself with four hours of um, reading. So you double the time that you lost to a movie to something else of gain, mm -hmm. right? So you, be, if, yeah. okay, okay. if you spend right. two hours on a film, you spend mm -hmm. two hours on a film, right? Then double the time of spending, say, say, tell yourself, I'm going to spend four hours watching maybe four documentaries about the evolution of the stock market or four documentaries about, uh, I don't know, uh, how, like one documentary about how, how athletes work. I love watching uh, documentaries about uh, long distance runners, trail runners, and um, uh, long distance cycling races. I, I, I love watching those documentaries and mountain climbing. Run. The next time we I come, we're going for a run. And it's going to be a run, run, bro. Yeah, let's do it. Let's see what you're made of. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, fine, let's do it. I, I did it. Well, yeah, let, we'll talk about times when we'll, we we'll do it. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do it now. Next time I come. Continue. Um, so I think that, yeah, it's, it's about uh, people understanding that if you, whatever amount of time you spend on anything mm -hmm. cannot be taken back, right? I, I repeat, as I'm saying this, I'm actually talking to myself as well. Whatever amount of time that you spend on anything cannot be taken back, right? So if you spend one and a half hours on Instagram perusing through those videos and the, the funny ones of this and that, the other, watching those videos of police brutality or watching videos of funny babies laughing or watching videos of uh, rappers talking about their cars, uh, that's one and a half hours spent on that, right? Know that you're not going to get back that one and a half hours. So how do you, uh, quote, get it back? You get it, get it back by reinvesting one, another one and a half to three hours on the opposite material. So one and a half, three hours of reading you know, uh, financial journals, reading The Economist, gone on YouTube. YouTube has, do you know that the YouTube, the size of YouTube today, I think is twice the size of the entire internet was in 1999, no, no, 2004, right? That's just YouTube, bro. Can you imagine how many documentaries there are on YouTube about how to, and these are documentaries done by channels like History Channel and all the kind of things, CNBC, MSNBC, Bloomberg, right? Like one, one and a half hours spent on Instagram, spend that time equivalent on watching videos or, or, or about the, the history of financial institutions and how you as a pedestrian can turn $500 into $5,000 over the course of three years, right? It is, it is your responsibility. No, nobody, no matter how much effort anybody else puts into enlightening other people. At the end of the day, it is the responsibility of each and every capable individual mm -hmm. to do this themselves, right? And my, one of my greatest inspirations comes from this guy called Tony Giles, right? Tony Giles is a British, uh, uh, he's, he's a British man. And he has traveled, I think so far to 185 countries and counting, right? He has okay. visited every single state in America. He has gone to every single country in South America. Um, and like I said, count all the other countries around the world. And he travels completely by himself, by the way. And Tony Giles is 100% blind and 80% deaf. And his hearing is getting worse. It's deteriorating. But every single one of those countries, he has done them by himself. Spoil, right? Spell his last name again. Is it Tony? Spell his last name? Tony Giles. G-I-L-E-S. So if okay. you just type in Tony Giles Traveler. That man, I watched that man's documentary last year as if I have not absorbed enough inspiration as it is to this day. But I remember watching Tony Giles and I, was, I said to myself, categorically, I 
do not have an excuse. I just don't. If you are capable, if your, your hands are functioning, your eyes can see, your ears can hear, your mouth can speak, your, leg, your feet can walk you, right? I have no excuse whatsoever to say, I couldn't X, I shouldn't blah, yeah. I won't X. Tony Giles has visited 185 countries by himself. And listen, man, the logistics of this man's traveling are just mind boggling, right? He will uh, go on, on the computer, writing in Braille, he goes into chat groups, and he'll say, hi, uh, like, for example, what, what my most fa my most, uh, the most fascinating trip he did was when he went to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So he goes in a chat group, uh, Tourism One, says, hi, my name is Tony Giles. I'm blind and I'm deaf. I travel alone, uh, but uh, I'm arriving at X and I'm looking for an Airbnb that I can rent. I'm looking for somebody to pick me up at the airport and so on and so forth. And essentially, this guy has to give his passport to complete strangers when he's crossing borders. Right, he has to give his name. He has to give certain details to everybody. Right, complete strangers he doesn't know, and he only found them online. And when he needs cash, he says, "I." I somebody asked him, "How do you withdraw money?" He said, "I go to an ATM and I ask somebody, a complete stranger, can you help me withdraw X amount of money in your local denomination?" And he says, "I have to trust that person in that moment. I have no choice. I have to trust him." And in so far, never had like he's if somebody like that can do that, I have no excuse. I don't, you know? This world is far too big in this world. The world is a lot more beautiful than it is uh, ugly. The world, people are a lot more good than they are bad. People mm -hmm. are a lot more giving than they are stingy, right? People are a lot more open than they are closed. Therefore, with that, utilize and take advantage of it, right? And say to yourself that the open sources that you see that are available in the world, trust them, use them, and empower yourself. Indeed. Indeed. So we're gonna we're gonna conclude in about five minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> indeed, right. So all the things that you know you spoke about, we spoke about a lot of things. A lot. Definitely <laughs> when it comes on to maybe, you know, I, I call it the journey of self-mastery, at, at least yes. for myself. Um, like, you know, I'm on it, I'm off it, I'm on it. But it's a mm. it's a lifelong thing. And when you, you know, all the things that you talk about can be implemented. And I think the resistance, because there's so much information, maybe the people that are watching right now are people who are probably inquisitive. Yes. You know, people who are always trying to learn more, do more. Um, for me personally, my thing is, is about just uh, my purpose, whatever that is, the thing that's inside me, that's driving me. My thing is to fulfill that before I go, because we all got to go at one point. Yes. So, oh, yeah. As you said as well, you know, when you spend like um, this guy said, when you spend a day, you have you have one less day to spend. Days yes. are so expensive. So the same when you invest time doing something, and that's why I couldn't do certain other type of like things that I were, was doing before for much longer, because I'm literally spending away my life. I'm utilizing the thing? currency of 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 time. Life. Yeah. Can I say one thing on on that very thing about you have one day less to spend? Somebody else put it this way. You, today, as you stand here today, is the youngest you will ever be, and it is the oldest you have ever been. Today is the youngest you will ever be, and it is the oldest you have ever been. Think of it what you will. Because you only have the present, right? Because you only have the present as well, like this moment in time. It's like you haven't, you haven't, you can't get back the past. Yeah. Right? Or, and you can't experience the future yet. So you no. exist. This moment in time you exist in this moment you are at your youngest right now you are at your youngest you are at the youngest point that you ever will be again ever again indeed, indeed. <laughs> right because okay. everything else behind you is gone <clears throat> so you are at the, at the youngest point you ever will be again there is no point in saying when i was 25 i had this much energy okay so what where's your 25 now 25 is for me 10 years behind me <laughs> yeah. right also you're older now we're older now in this moment in time than when we began the interview that's like right Precisely, right. I'm two hours right. older now, and I've got two hours worth of wisdom exchanged. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, no. So that's so that's that's what it's about. So I think, um, in terms of uh, leaving the discussion, um, I think, um, one, you touched on a lot of things, right? And all the things that you said, for people who are capable, for people yes. who uh, find themselves uh, in a position where they want to learn more or, or do more or contribute more. But they find that for some reason they don't want to do the work because it's too much or they're, it's not that attractive. That's where you have to force yourself. And that's something that 
um, the person, ha- the onus is on the individual to do the work. Yeah. That's it. Because there's no other way. And I use a simple, this is just a simple example, but it's a principle. Don't watch the example, but watch the principle behind it. When we're talking about replacing habits and yes. or building good habits, that's all it is. got to force yourself to do it. And we know everything, almost everything that will uh, take you to another level is hard work. If you yep. want to matriculate from where you are to somewhere else to the next level, you got to go beyond your comfort zone. It's That's almost right. imperative. And I, That's so right. one way to get there is to force yourself. You got to go through that. Some people feel as though if it's not um, comfortable or enjoyable, they don't want to do it. It won't be, but no. you have to. And I say this, this is one thing I live my life by outlast the struggle. You yes. have to be able to outlast the struggle. You have to be able to outlast that discomfort and go through it. And so you gotta, you gotta just make up your mind. Okay, look, this is gonna suck. Yes, <laughs> it's gonna suck. And do it long enough. Give yourself six to six days. I'm just gonna use what the book said, or even yes. ninety days, right? Yes. But at least thirty days to engage in that activity that will take you higher. And do it every single day without yes. fail. Do whatever you have to do to bring yourself to that that position. And if you find yourself faltering after day number seven, start again. Begin again from day one and try until you reach that level. And you will find yourself, as long as you don't um, disrupt your momentum, you'll find yourself in a, in a, a frame of mind that can take you where you need to go. And just like you said, Q, reading the right things. Look, you will be smarter if you read something on a certain subject matter. You will yeah. become an expert in that after a while, or at yeah. least uh, fairly competent in that subject if you spend enough time. That's all fairly it is. Fairly competent and able to engage with experts. Whereas sometimes when you are completely ignorant of a subject when you and you listen to experts, you disengage because you're like, oh, well, I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. Right? But when you read enough, you're not reading to become an expert. You are reading enough to be able to engage with an expert talking so that you may actually be further enlightened. That's what reading is about. Indeed. And you won't get lost as well. Because for me, I like listening. And of course, I don't know a lot of stuff, right? Um, yeah. A lot of things. There are some areas that I'm really good in and some that I'm ignorant in, as in I don't know what's going on in the area. But I'm an eternal student. I've always been that way. Exactly. I listen to people. Like when we're talking in Singapore, I'm just there listening for most of it. Right? Yep. I'm listening to it. I will have arguments with people, but they think I'm not listening, but I listen to what they're saying. Or if I disagree, I'm taking it in because I understand okay. that this is my approach. I'm like, look, if you're telling me something that I don't know, if I re- if I reject it, I'm an idiot. Because yes, now right. I won't know something. That's right. right exactly. You have, it, you have it and you're trying to give it's it to fault. me. It's my fault. It's my fault. Yeah. And I'm refusing that. No. So for me, I'm like, okay, you know what? Okay. And I don't mind feeling like an idiot because you have to be there. You yes, have to. That's right. Yeah, exactly. People, you have to humble yourself enough to yeah, know that I'm being an idiot some, here. Yeah. Some people feel like, um, you don't want to be embarrassed. Look, y'all see, y'all watch my streams. When I do my live streams, I am just as I'm as transparent as a as a glass or whatever. Yeah. I don't care. I will make mistakes. I will listen to a person, but trust me, when I leave that conversation, I am getting. I'm learning something else. So if You're you think up. we engage and I'm at the same level, I'm at a higher level because that's me. I'm like, you know what? Okay, yeah. There's a lot that you don't know. There's, I won't know everything in my lifetime. I don't have enough time to learn everything, but what can I learn from this person? What can I learn from that person? Learn from their experiences and I move on. So I'm never at the same level. Tomorrow I'll be at a higher level because I want to learn something right. else. Right. Exactly. And I'm, if I'm not an expert in it, maybe at least I'll try my best to become competent. And if it's something that can, that will aid me in my personal journey, the goal that I have for my life, then I'll implement yeah. it. And I think that's the approach. And I think you're the same way as well where it's about consumption of information, finding what you need. So for those people who are, you know, watching and maybe who might see this um, after, all the things that you spoke about, they have what it takes. If they're watching the video, they have the resources, right? Yep. So all you got to do is invest the time and get through the process where it's going to suck and until you find yourself doing things that you're like, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, look, what? look at this, I'm yeah. doing this. You know, you're eating something. And, that and you will never even notice that you're becoming better because it's a slow, slow curve, right? Incremental gains. So you'll never realize you're becoming better. It's just that one day you're going to turn around, find yourself in a room. And you're like, oh, wow, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, you know, like, um, you know, like talking to you as well, because like you have so much insight on certain things. And then, you know, like you're like, OK, you, you know, you you did the work and then you can share and enlighten other people as well. So for those who are watching, um, definitely that's just something practical that you can do, because one yeah. thing we need to do is practical things. And I think there was a video I sent you the link to that video. I'm not sure if you saw it, but some of the comments were I think it was that vi- video or, or another one where people were saying people are talking all the time. 
you know, like the black community were discussing things from 19 how long, you know, till now we're still discussing, having conversations. But the problem is execution. And yes. even with the wealth of, wealth of information and uh, on the internet, people fail to execute because now there's just so much. And usually anything that you have in large supply, people just disregard it. Uh, yes. they, it anyway, it's cheap. Like, oh, well, it's cheapened. Moment, yeah. But the moment it's gone, the moment That's it's gone. That's where you value you can't find, you want to find a book in something where you can't find it. That's when you want it. Well, right? uh, like, to, to make a much more relevant uh, contemporary cultural example, look at how much more value Nipsey Hussle suddenly had once he was killed. Yeah. Right? Look, look at how much more value he had once that man was killed. And up until that point, I mean, I'd been following Nipsey Hussle for three years prior to that, right? And yeah. I found the guy fascinating. And I remember thinking to myself, I have to find a way to get to, to engage these guys, right? Um, and suddenly, you know, uh, and he was wearing like, was it the, the TMC, he, the, the marathon clothing line, right? Suddenly from going to, let's say going from, I think maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 revenue per month, right? The guy gets killed. And within the first 30 days after his death, the website used to have an average purchase of $200. And within the first 30 days, no, it wasn't even 30 days, first seven days, sorry, mm -hmm. of him dying, the, av the, the, the website had uh, $200 million worth of orders. Wow. Stagger. So we say, no, but the thing is, we say, wow. But I go back to, to the point that you just made. Once something is gone, that's when we suddenly realize its value. Yeah. Right? So we have to change that. That has to change. Why is Nipsey Hussle so much more valuable now that it's gone? No. But anyway. Yeah, just like a lot of other people too, man. All the, it's, yeah. but you know what? Um, yeah, one thing that I guess people can take away if if people are just wondering hopefully we provided something of value um to people who are watching um you know like all the things that q spoke about uh when it comes down to execution and implementing it if you're not a person that's you know predisposed to like consuming these things and people are like why are you just taking in all these things force yourself force yourself to do it force yourself to do yep. it yep. until and the onus is on you as an individual to get to that level um, oh, but yeah. i'm definitely concerned about the most vulnerable and um, there are certain things in my head that op hopefully one day I'm able to implement um, to try to like help those those people. Um, but definitely, man, um, we'll maybe have a part two, another discussion, another time. But let's just ask people really briefly. Uh, ten minutes. You have ten minutes. Yeah. Okay, guys. Any questions? I know that you guys were having like a different conversation, talking about all sorts of things. I wasn't re really reading reading the comments, so I'm not sure what you guys are saying. <laughs> But if you do have any questions, can you pose them now? And I'll ask, uh, you know, Mr. Q on your behalf. So, like, maybe we'll take, like, five questions, 10 minutes, two minutes each. That's directed toward Mr. Q, and then we can, we'll conclude. So, let's see what you guys are saying. Um, yeah. you Like, the usually, I'm on for, like, an hour these days, but I gave you, like, more. Yeah, than, dude, I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, have I ever... Have minutes. I broken some sort of protocol? Because this has gone way over. <laughs> really the thing is, is well, yeah, I don't. I guess I don't have much flexibility in time. So when I do it this long, I sacrifice something else. But um, I just decided to just let it go. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I I only hope I didn't ramble on too much. I only hope I didn't bore anyone. You know, um, people are saying different things, but you know what? That's the way it is. The audience. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. Them, right. So the thing is, as long as you felt like you shared your heart and we. Oh, and that's, well, okay. that, and that's, that's all I'm interested in. Oh, here's a question. Here's a question. Someone said, what books do you read? So what I'll say is, give us five books, your top five, or at least five <laughs> books, right? Maybe, yeah, okay. five. Well, you know, no, no, let me just, three, because you know what? Not even three. Let Give one book. Why am I going to say one? Maybe two. You know what? I'm a yeah. reader. I can read whatever, but I know that people usually buy books and they don't read it. So just two books then. Two books. Two Increase books. the chance of them reading it. Two <laughs> Okay, uh, so the first one is in my uh, in my current the early adulthood is the most important book that's happened to me in the last fifteen years, which is uh, Outliers: The Story of Success by Malcolm Gladwell. That is the most important book that's ever happened to me. Oh, wow. uh, I see the book happened to me. I didn't just read it, but it happened to me. So that's oh, wow. definitely the most important book. It, and it may not resonate with anyone else in the same way, but it's just that when something happens to you at the right time. Mm -hmm. that's when you feel it more if i read for the first time outliers today it wouldn't have the same impact just what yeah okay, so i read it at the right at the perfectly opportune moment 
So Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, right? Yes, my outlaws okay. Malcolm Gladwell. And number two. Second book. Let me see. I've got my library behind me here. Uh, maybe even something that is different from from like PD. Maybe something else. Yeah, no, no. Uh, so, no, no. I'm going to give you something completely different from PD. Trust me. <laughs> um, I um... Oh, Okay, someone's asking a question. Okay. So, uh, for example, it's, it's a two-volume uh, book. It's called The Greek Myths. Okay, The Greek Myths, right? The Greek Myths. One second, one second. Let me just show you. Hold on. The Greek myths. Robert Graves. And what? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because, okay. because I, I was a literature fiend when I was in school. And uh, I had an English literature teacher who I was absolutely frightened of, but I loved her because she, she, she opened my mind. And uh, she, it, she taught me that the basis of all Western literature is Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. All of it, even the Bibles to an extent. Well, some of it anyway, some, some, of, the, some of the Western versions of the Bible. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, the Greek myths for me, I find absolutely fascinating. I'm obsessed with like, for example, the Sisyphus uh, story, incredible. Okay. So yeah, two books. So two books, right? So um, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers yep. and the Greek myths yep. by, 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 by Robert Graves. Robert Graves. Yeah. Right, so those are two books. Uh, the next question is, um, okay, okay, what do you do on days that you you don't feel like doing the stuff that gets you closer to your goal. What do I do on days? Yeah, what do you do? Okay, what do you do on the days that you don't feel like doing the stuff that will get you closer to your goals? Um. Oh, I like this. Uh, this I, I I formulated this within myself, which is uh, when you are really when I'm really struggling, when mm -hmm. all else fails, I either look within. Or I look to the sea. So essentially, I sort of meditate. Okay. You know? uh, or if I don't have time to meditate, I just like laugh at my daughter. My daughter just always makes me laugh. <laughs> so, and, and I also move myself away from anything of trying to do better because clearly the mind is not working. So you should remove yourself from any attempt to do better and uh, go and refresh yourself by doing something completely unrelated and you come back stronger. Okay. Okay, cool. My approach with that is it depends. That might, taking a break might help. But usually for me, um, they're, they're not asking me so, but I'm just going to say this, <laughs> is I do it regardless, right? It's like yeah, so, so that's the other thing. I, mm -hmm. I do that with running. So I was, I was going to say, actually, you have to contextualize it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's either work or it's uh, fitness or it's health or whatever. So for me, with uh, exercise, I do it regardless. Like I, I just tell, I, I don't listen to it. Like if, if the mind is like, oh, I'm tired of like, oh, whatever. My body needs this. I don't care what you're thinking. Yeah. I'm going to go out there and do it. So I go, I go, I go into automating good habits. Indeed. All right. So that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. All right. So let's see. The next one is, um, I said five questions, right? But let's see. what. Yeah. Um, let's see. Someone said, do you have a website? So tell them your website. Yeah. So just take this time to shout your website, social media. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's theprefecture.com. Theprefecture.com. Um, and it's in its very, very rudimentary stages right now. Uh, so whatever you're going to see is a skeleton of the monster that I'm going to create over the next year. <laughs> um, you are literally just seeing a skeleton being slowly uh, put together and then it's going to be fleshed out. But it's theprefecture.com. Um, and also on social media, our most, so our most active social media is uh, Instagram, which is uh, the prefecture on there as well, just the prefecture. You will recognize us by the emblem of the pheasant um okay so that's i believe this is it the prefix yep. just in there and then as well um what, what's it on instagram again the prefecture right yeah just the prefecture and as soon as you see the the, the pheasant emblem that's when that that's us okay that's it right there all right so the next question is yeah so guys go check it out um drop him a message on social media as well do you do like do you sell things online as well can people order not as yet no so currently the brand is strictly bespoke clothing custom made but that's also part of the uh, mandatory sir i know i know i know i know i know <laughs> so like but like i said uh it uh, what's been it's happening over the, last, over the last three months in the background there's been a lot of stuff brewing so the next 12 six, six to 12 months are going to be uh, a game changer for me anyway 
and you guys will see me wearing some of Q's clothing as well. Indeed, like, indeed. <laughs> watching about that interview, and I'm like, I like that shirt. People are saying they like it. It's purple, which works so well with my complexion as yeah. well. And with the yeah. white, it's pretty good as well. There you go, there you go, exactly. So we'll, I'll be, you know, I'll be wearing some of your stuff, so you guys can look out for that as well. We will mandate that you have to wear the prefect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do some other things as well going forward. Um, but uh, you guys just stay tuned for um some announcements. Um, let's see. This is Punta. How to use internal frust? How to use internal frustration in a way to bring positive changes in our life? Oh, that's a very interesting one. So internal frustration. Uh, is usually a frustration and an anger with oneself, right? Is an anger with oneself. So first and foremost, you have to be able to just look yourself in the mirror, like quite literally, look yourself in the mirror, find all the things. And then one thing I learned was write in maybe two or three sentences how you would describe yourself if you were not you, right? How would you describe yourself if you were not you, if you came across you on the street and you spoke with you for about an hour and a half, how would you describe you, right? This is all to do with dealing with internal frustration, by the way, right? So write those things, three to five sentences. And then once a, I'd say in the beginning stages, do it once a week, but eventually do it once a month. Once a month without looking at the previous descriptions, write another description of yourself, right? And, and, and try and condense it as well. Try using maybe five words. Try using, uh, you know, uh, maybe two sentences or whatever it is. Or like five sentence, five word sentences three times, right? But each month, write a description of yourself. And then at the end of 12 months, remember, you have to have the patience to exercise incremental gains. At the end of 12 months, right, look back at all those descriptions of yourself. And in between those descriptions, you have to actively engage things and material, right, that decisively makes you uh, know something that you didn't know before, right? Decisively allows you to know something that you did not know before, right? Uh, so that's how you do it. Okay. And then over the course of 12 months, you reflect on it. That would be a very interesting task. That that sounds like something that I might even uh, think about doing. It sounds interesting, yeah. actually. <laughs> so you're looking at yourself objectively then? Objective, exactly. That's And that's the thing. You have to exercise. One of the greatest um, processes of exercising enlightenment is to be as objective about yourself as possible, right? That really can does pave the way. Can be painful too. <laughs> extremely, extremely. It, it pay, like, uh, for example, for me, I love being uh, scathed with criticism, right? So yesterday, I'm talking to a friend uh, uh, via Google Meets, and I said to him, look at my website and give me the feedback. And he was like, oh, dude, I'm not sure if you're going to like this. And I said to him, go ahead, deliver it, right? He was like, dude, I'm not going to say something nice. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't respect you if you said something nice just to keep me quiet. So he went ahead and just like basically smashed and sliced the website together. And, and he was telling me all these things that could have, I know that five, six years ago would have really had me discouraged and, and, and uh, feeling down and out. But I, I literally just turned them into five bullet points. And that's exactly what I'm going to implement going forward. Indeed, nice. Someone else is asking for three more books. So I guess for readers, so someone, I said two because I know that people buy books and they don't read them. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think my, what I could, one advice, unsolicited advice, I know. Sorry, guys. I like giving <laughs> advice. And I don't know anything but I like giving advice, right? Um, just, if you don't like reading, get Audible, all right? Yes, and another yeah. way to yourself to consume stuff is a plate in your house if you drive plate in your car you run you listen to it while you're running and it will get into your head um so if you don't have the time even though it's, it's good to be engaged in a book um and sometimes when you're if you're listening to a book on audible you might not be as engaged it depends what activity you're engaging in in that moment in time but that's one way uh to consume certain uh information without you know like forcing yourself to get a book and say i don't like reading Audible yep. is alternative. Um, so someone is asking for three books, uh, five books actually. So you gave two earlier. Oh. Add three more to the list for this person who um, might want to go and read. So I would say, like I said, I like to mix it all up for, for stuff that's entertainment, for stuff that's going to be uh, enlightening. And But because my drive is about economic empowerment, mm -hmm. um, there's this author, we talked about him, was Anderson. Anderson? There's, oh, there's an author. Robert Green? Robert Green? Is it Robert there's Robert Green, but no, no, there's a guy called something Anderson. Uh, anyway, it'll come back to me. Mm -hmm. um, but books to read about, uh, for example, finance, 
um, read a book uh, called The Intelligent Investor, one of the oldest ones. But if you can't be bothered to read that, read The Snowball by Warren Buffett. Okay, you know, I started to read, I, I never finished the, the Intelligent Investor. I, I have yeah. it though. I do. Yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're not easy reads. Um, <laughs> really, they're I'm not like, easy reads. Let, was, let me find you one, hey, one, or, one or two more books. One second. That one. Okay, so in, Intelligent Investor is one, um, SD, that's number three. And then what was the next one? The Snowball, I think you said, by Warren Buffett. That's another one as well. Um, yeah, Ronin said YouTube has a bunch of audiobooks. I think those books, like people that upload those books, might be infringing the copyright of the authors, but I don't know. So I don't know what's being said. Well, I got my back turned. <laughs> you know, it's okay. I was, we were talking about, um, someone was saying um, YouTube has audiobooks. Yes. Um, but yeah. Okay, so one of my most fascinating books, I find this book, I find it hilarious in the sense that um, I understand, like I find Indian culture it, it really fascinating. Their history, uh, the history of Indian culture is, is ridiculous. But in India, there's this thing called Jugad, right? And uh, Jugad uh, is, a, is a practice of accidental innovations, right? And and I know that for a fact, uh, well, not just for a fact that I lived this, right? But in Lagos, like one American guy from uh, Silicon Valley, he once said the next great invention is not waiting to happen. It's already happened and it's stuck somewhere in the middle of Lagos. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. So the next great invention is already here, but it's stuck in the middle of Lagos because there's no access to proliferating out there. So anyway, in India, that accidental uh thing or process of innovating is called jugad so this book is hilarious because um as it is hilarious but it's also actually a very serious academic book uh, so jugad. In, in jugad. yeah that's right jugad okay right and it's literally about how people in places who's, of who, extreme who, who's the author let me because it's, it's actually written by three people um i would just say look up the title you 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 you, okay. you, you yeah, look up the title. It's written by three people, and it'll come up. And I'm what's amazing, right? what's amazing about this book is just simply about how it describes how people in extreme poverty are constantly innovating with such amazing ability and capacity that they don't even realize it. Take, for example, have you ever heard of uh, Dabawalas? I haven't. Oh, in, Mumbai, in Mumbai, there's, there's a, a trade, or these men, they're called Dabawalas, right? Dabawalas, this, this is fascinating. I want to try to be brief, sorry. But what happens with Dabawalas is that um, they, are, uh, they deliver lunches for people in their offices, right? And the, the way it happens is, uh, let's say a, a stay-at-home wife or maybe a maid cooks a lunch or a dinner, and there's a color code at the bottom of the tin, right? A tiffin tin. She goes to this corner where these Dabawalas are always gathered, and then the mm -hmm. Dabawalas, right? would deliver it. And double wallers deliver thousands, tens of thousands. There are only a few hundred of them, but they deliver tens of thousands of meals every single day. And double wallers are a perfect example of Jugad because these guys are completely illiterate. None of them are educated. Okay. Yet, they only make a mistake. Listen to this, right? Listen to very, very carefully. They only mis make a mistake once out of every six million deliveries. Oh, wow. They have an accuracy rate. Well, there's a word used. Toyota is one of the world's only companies that have got this accuracy. Um, the 99.9% the .9 thing. I'm not sure what you call it. So there's a system in in financial literature and business school. Uh, there's a system. There's a there's a word for these types of companies. There are only I think there's a tiny handful of them. Maybe about fifteen of them. Like Fortune 500 companies. Only only about fifteen of the Fortune 500 companies have got this rating. But essentially, it means that you've got a ninety nine point nine percent accuracy rate of delivery. I think BMW are part of it. Maybe VW or something like that. Right. The double wallers are in there listed at that. Oh wow. These are illiterate men who make a mistake once in only a couple of million deliveries, dude. And Jugard is a, is, is a part of what describes this. And I saw it when I went to Delhi years ago. I saw it in, in effect. I saw a double wall. Uh, Someone said Six Sigma. Is that it? Six Sigma. Yes, that's it. Yes, Six, six, six Sigma. And that's what, yes. Companies mm -hmm. that rarely make a mistake in all their processes. The double wallers are illiterate. They never went to school, yet they almost never make a mistake. And there is a guy who's been trying to write an academic PhD paper on them for years. And he's like, I failed to understand how the other day. 
<laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Six Sigma companies. That's right. They are very. It's a very rare designation to have. So, so read Jugard. I'll, I'll get that book. And, and, and the thing is, Jugard, by the way, this is just ri simply written about India, but this is something that happens all across Africa all the time and all across the black community all the time, especially in Western countries. When they have been subjugated, they innovate by virtue of whatever's in front of them. I think, yeah, I think that that's true of black people, definitely. Yeah. That's why I find that book amazing because that's essentially what the music industry is today, right? Hip hop started off by poets on the corners innovating just the way they were. Yeah, those are my books. So, so, wait, so you go and read. let's uh, go through the list again. So, one is Outliers. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers. <laughs> so, you list them up, list them up. Yeah. You can uh, list Outliers them. by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, we've got uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the, the Greek Myths by Robert Graves. Mm -hmm. uh, there is The Snowball by uh, Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's Jugard. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, intelligent Investor as well. Uh, the Intelligent Investor. It's just that, oh, I left out Intelligent Investor because Snowball and Intelligent Investor are more or less the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. There is one more book I would love to add in there, which uh, also on a more creative side, I found completely mind-blowing, uh, was a book called Beloved by Toni Morrison. Okay. That sounds yeah. cool. Really tragic book, but beautifully written. Tony Morrison is called Beloved. So that's more creative writing there. Okay, cool. And yeah. I, look, I've read so many other books. I feel like I'm doing a disservice by only recommending these five. But <laughs> I, know, I know what you mean, man. I know what you mean. There's, yeah. I guess maybe I could throw one in, in the list. Um, I, well, you know, I like this book a lot. It's definitely in my, I think it's in my, it's in my top 10. Um, I like um, The 50 at Law. I think it's, yes, yeah, Robert Greene and Fifty Cent, right? Yeah, yeah, think, yeah. That's that's I an amazing it, book. I think it touches on something that um, a lot of people might be plagued with. It might help a lot of people. So the yeah. 50, add that to your reading, yep. um, if you want. There's like so many books out there, anyways. But yeah, there are a lot of books, man. Whatever I recommend is little more than right. just my own. And anyway, implement it. So if there's something in the book, um, you got to implement something. Sometimes you're reading a book. Oh, here's another one. It's not. Well, you know what? This one is actually kind of cool. Um, thinking fast and slow. Ah, uh, like, yes, yeah. So thinking uh, fast, uh, and slow, put that on your list. You know what? Work, like that one. Uh, Fifty Allies is amazing as well, but thinking fast and slow. Yeah. Add that to your list. Um, I believe it's by Daniel Kahneman. Um, amazing. Yeah. Um, anyways, it teaches a, a lot of stuff. I think it has, it has a lot to do with like prejudice and the reason why people think the way they think do the things they do, it explains bias and all that good stuff. And I think yeah. it's a book that you can give anyone that's prejudiced or racist or whatever. Yeah. And just just give them the book and let them read yeah. it. By reading the book, they'll just be like, it the book alone will 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 do what it needs to do. Illuminate, it's yeah, exactly. Point. It's an amazing book. Um but anyways, um so I guess we're gonna conclude there. Wait, any yeah um, man. Almost three hours in. <laughs> uh, bro, trust me like any um, other question? <laughs> um do you have Okay, so oh, we got a troll. We got these trolls. I don't know how these trolls find me on Facebook. I'm just like they're just scrolling for black faces or something. Like I'm like, wait, 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 what's the troll saying? Let's hear it. <laughs> it's the same. No, it's like no. I've seen like the same like. Um, let's not get into it. Nonsense. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah, never mind. And they just write some dumb stuff. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, never mind. Never mind. The same. Yeah, it's like usually they have a white a profile picture of a Caucasian person. I'm not, I'm not sure if they're white or not. But it's yeah. all the same type of thing that's come on and they write rubbish. Um. So, anyways. I think that's it for questions, right? I think that's it. Uh, you know, I, I've taken up too much of your time, uh, but I know that, you know, you like to share as well. So well, now I have, a, I have my wife and my four-year-old daughter to answer to. It's like, you were always called for three hours. <laughs> yeah, it's family time, right? Yeah. It's, it's definitely family time. Exactly. All right, uh, man. But thanks so much for coming on, Q. Again, guys, you can find him on Instagram at the prefecture, right? One word, right? Yes, yeah, the, the prefecture, that's right. Yeah. Right. And then you can and also... look for the pheasant emblem, a blue navy blue pheasant. Yeah. Indeed. So the pheasant I can show it. One second. Just so that you're familiar with it. And then oh, you know, as well as the interview that we did where okay, let me find that while he gets what did he get? You can check out the interview. Um, there you go. as well. All right. I remember the first time. I'm not going to lie. When you told me about a pheasant the first time, I'm like, what is a pheasant? <laughs> <laughs> what is a pheasant? Yeah, now know? you know. Now it's you like, all know. No, I know. It. <laughs> you, you, you know, you taught me that. Oh, a pheasant. Oh, it's a bird. Okay. Yes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is, the, right, this is the, um, the link 
to the full interview that we did on the main channel. And if you guys are watching right now and you're, you aren't subscribed because there's still at least a high percentage of you guys who aren't subscribed, maybe 40% of you guys who are watching. I don't get it. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers on this channel. Come on, mm -hmm. guys. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching. Oh, Q, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for watching and listening. All right. And let me know if you guys want Q back on again. We might do another one. Let's see what the people say. If you're down to come back on, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If, <laughs> if they'll have me, if you have me, if they'll have me. And then you have to go with the voice of the people. Of course, right? Yeah. Um, but but thanks a lot, man. I'm pretty sure that they, they'll... We'll talk. We'll talk off air. But thanks for coming on, man. Take care. Thank you very much. Take care. All right, take care. Bye. So, guys, that was Q, uh, Mr. Q. Um, yeah, so we did. We were on this for like two hours and 44 minutes. Honestly, that was a long time. That I wasn't even planning to do a live stream uh, for this long today. Um, the, the absolute limit is is two hours, and we went over that. But anytime like, I'm having a conversation with, with Q, like we always talk for a long time. Um, but yeah, so we'll definitely have him back on again. And then we can, if you guys want to talk about something specific, um, we can talk about that as well. Um, yeah. So if you guys have like a topic that you want us to cover, um, let's talk about it. You know, just write it in the chat, send me an email, send me a tweet, send me something. And then we can have that. We can, we can talk about that and we will have other guests as well. Um, definitely from all over the world, across the world. Um, that will come on from time to time and we'll talk about it again guys thanks for coming on we appreciate you i hope you guys learned something something at the very at the very least i know i've learned a few things and i've um some new books to add to my list um of of reads for this year and um at least you guys have a, a title that you can go to and if you never learned anything from this where you weren't inspired or stimulated in some way shape or form at least one of those books most definitely We'll do that for you. Um, the, yeah, you guys can watch the replay of the video as well. So you can you can check it out from the beginning. Again, guys, thanks so much for coming on again. Um, I'll catch you guys uh, tomorrow again, 10 a.m. JST. We go live daily. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. I, again, I hope it was valuable at least a little bit, man. We just spent three hours, of, three hours of our lives on this live stream. I hope it helped you in some way, shape, or form. Bye for now, guys. Until next time, kiyoskete. Bye, guys. I appreciate y'all.